the May 14, 2014 work session of the Board of Trustees of the Village of Austin. Please join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, just a few announcements before uh, we begin. There, two events just happened in the village. Uh, the one that, that uh, is freshest in my mind was a ceremony honoring our police, uh, our auxiliary police, and our citizens who aided in the capture of uh, suspects and avoided future crimes. Uh, in some cases, they were uh, suspects who were involved in previous crimes that had not been apprehended. Uh, it was a very moving ceremony, bless you, a very moving ceremony. And um, at the same time, uh, the Austin Arts Council had its selfies uh, exhibit open, uh, and, and it'll be open for a month. It will be at uh, the firehouse, the second floor of the firehouse on Main Street, and I recommend that everyone go and see it. Um, so, um, on Friday evening at 7 o'clock at the Austining High School, there, there will be a concert called Austining's Got Talent. It is a, uh, an event that is basically a fundraiser for the Riley Saper Foundation. Uh, Riley was a, a young student who died a number of years ago uh, at a very young age of leukemia, I believe. Uh, it was very sad, and his, his father and some friends put, and his mother put together this foundation. They've been raising money ever since towards, uh, towards cures uh, uh, of leukemia. On Sunday, um, May 18th, uh, you can be a champion to Clearview School. Uh, you can join them for the first annual, we hope, uh, 5K race walk fundraiser for the kids. Uh, it's a day program for children at ages uh, K through 12 uh, through, through 21. Um, and serving, this is uh, an organization that has day programs that serve uh, the Westchester, New York City, Putnam, Dutchess, Rockland, and Orange counties restoring hope and giving children and families challenged by mental illness a special environment in which to grow, learn, and work through their challenges. Uh, this is a very worthy cause, and it's, the weather has been really terrific of late. Uh, we may have some rain between now and then, but let us hope by then the rain will have cleared out. It will be a beautiful day, so please join us. Registration starts at 745 at the community center. The Kids Fun Run um, is at 8.45. The 5K Run starts at 9. The Walk starts at 9.05 uh, for those of us no longer capable of running that distance. Uh, the Award Ceremony is at 10. The Raffle Drawing at 10.15. The first 100 participants will uh, receive a Race Day T-shirt. Uh, all. Uh, receive Clearview Sound, the um, Clearview School 5K water bottles. Uh, there'll be post-race uh, water and refreshments. So for further information, if anyone uh, would like, www.clairviewschool5k.com. Also on Sunday, um, from 11 to 3.30 uh, at the Austin Volunteer uh, Corps, uh, Austin Volunteer Ambulance Corps, or OVEX, uh, 18 Clinton Avenue headquarters, will be uh, celebrating the uh, annual, the 2014 Annual Emergency Medical Services Day. OVEC has been servicing the communities of Austin, Briarcliff, and Croton for many years, as well as uh, having mutual aid to other communities, um, which now include, uh, we, we now help uh, Sleepy Hollow's uh, ambulance system. Uh, there will be an open house, which will include uh, EMS, fire, and police vehicles on display, fun for the kids, along with refreshments, and it is free. Anyone else? Uh, 
I'll just remind everybody to, if you haven't visited energizeaustining.org, uh, any time of a year, any time of year is a good time to make your house more energy efficient, um, upgrade the upgrade your home so that you waste less energy, you waste less money, your home is more affordable to maintain, and your home is more valuable. Um, and it may not actually cost you any out-of-pocket money. Uh, so again, that's energizeaustening.org. You can check that out. And tomorrow night, it's the season where you get a lot of these uh, and you're really thirsty. Um, you drink a lot of water, often in water bottles if you're on the go. Um, and you may not know exactly where that water comes from or what what the uh, process of the life cycle of these bottles and what that really means to us. And uh, I encourage everyone to join us uh, Wednesday at 6.30, uh, Wednesday, May 15th at 6.30 at the Austin Public Library. We're going to screen the movie Tapped and then have a panel discussion. Um, in fact, one of our panelists is right here in the room with us right now. He's a village engineer, Paul Fraioli, and uh, as well as um, Dan Shapley from Riverkeeper, um, another... Uh, local name that people may be familiar with. Um, so I really encourage you to come out to the Austin Public Library at 6.30 uh, to see the movie Tapped. And I will just um, clarify one thing about the, the Riley Saper um, Foundation. It's, uh, it's a scholarship fund for a graduating Austining senior, um, and it is uh, based on academic achievement as well as financial need. So uh, if you're able to join us Friday night at the Austining High School for um, Austining's Got Talent, uh, last year's performances were just remarkable. So it, I hopefully uh, we'll see you there. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Starting May 17th, it is National Safe Boating Week. And that's the start of the boating season. And we ask everybody to boat smart, wear a life jacket, take a boating safety course, uh, and get a free vessel safety check from the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary or the U.S. Power Squadrons. Um, if you go on to go to Google any of the search engines and type in National Safe Boating Week, there's a plethora of activities going on. And go out and enjoy this amazing resource we have at the Hudson River. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have a very full agenda this evening with uh, many interesting items for the board to consider and for the public to uh, learn about. The first item is a, uh, it's a presentation discussion with Pace University streamlining the development approval process. Uh, the Board of Trustees engaged Pace University in order to look at the Village of Austin's uh, planning and building process to see uh, how it was functioning, what if anything might be done to improve it, and basically to give the board a status update and see if we could take advantage of any uh, modernization or uh, suggestions that would make the process even better. So we're fortunate to have had the, or to have, uh, and currently will have the services of PACE to help us with this review. And this evening we have uh, Jeff LaHava from PACE University, so I would ask uh, you to come forward. Good evening, Mayor. Um, Good evening, Jeff. Members of the uh, Board of Trustees, thank you very much uh, for allowing us to come and present this evening. Uh, we wanted to give you an update on the project in which you engaged us on back in uh, February uh, and to let you know the status of where we are, uh, what we've examined to date, kind of our initial thoughts um, and some initial recommendations. Uh, we will be providing our final assessment report uh, by the end of June um, and then we'll look also to putting together an implementation strategy. Um, but we wanted to at least be able to to give some of our um, uh, and, and download of initial uh, data gathering, information gathering, um, thoughts to date that we thought would be helpful for, uh, for the board to hear. So we have been engaged in what I would call our information gathering phase right now. Um, we've reviewed the village's zoning code, um, other related code provisions, uh, the various uh, land development approval applications, sample project files, as well as other documentation that both the uh, planning department and building department have provided to us. And we've been over those documents and discussed those documents um, with staff members. Um, we've held meetings with the planning and building department staff on February 26th, March 19th, April 30th, May 8th. Uh, we still need to arrange a meeting with the village engineer, but we'll, that'll be forthcoming. Um, we've then met with the various boards, so the, the planning Don't board. Don't leave without uh... <laughs> 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 Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, we've, we've met with the, uh, the, the 
Planning Board, ZBA, the Environmental Advisory uh, Council, as well as the Historic Preservation Commission. We held a public meeting on May 1st during the day, uh, not well attended. Uh, we have the opportunity for the public to comment again tonight, and should it be necessary, we'd be more than happy to hold another public session at some time during the evening, uh, maybe in early June. Um, and we've also reached out to specific developers, architects, and others who've been engaged in the land development approval process here in the village to get information from them on, again, what is working, what isn't working, what recommendations do they have for approvals. Um, so right now, uh, you know, in comparison to peer communities, the land development approval process here in the village is actually quite efficient. And I think that's important to understand that really what we're talking about is areas for improvement, not wholesale changes in the way the approval process works. So if you look at large projects like Avalon Bay, from the time their application was submitted for 168 unit development to when it was actually approved, including the CEQA review, that was 22 months. That is very quick. Um, when you look at even smaller projects like single family and two family homes, you know, many of those projects are approved in one to two months. On average, now this is for planning board approvals, on average in 2013, for all project types, your average was four months. Again, that's relatively quick compared to other communities here in Westchester. Um, <clears throat> most of the concerns about the land development approval process appear to stem from two situations. First, that applicants uh, do not timely respond to information requests from the various boards and or the departments. So you'll have um, you know, requests where additional information is necessary, even though the application is complete in the process of, of discussing that application before a board, maybe information um, or additional drawings are necessary about parking requirements, for example, and how parking is going to be configured on a particular lot because of that lot's um, configuration or circumstances. And there is then a time lag in, in a number of cases where that request is made, but then follow-up information is not provided by the applicant for you know, two months, three months, and then there's the back and forth. So we see a lag in projects. That is one consequence of, of that. Um, the, the other significant area is where applicants do not follow code requirements, either, either because it's done purposely um, or because their prior construction projects um, they were given a green light, but there's no documentation. So really what we're talking about then is having to go back and legalize those prior approvals, and that takes time. Um, for example, between January 2012 through December 31st, um, 2013, 41% of all zoning board appeals applications were to correct current violations or legalize existing construction that was never properly documented um, as discovered by the, the building department through its inspection processes. So these are things that have to go back and be corrected. Um, and fortunately, tomorrow, during a Corporation Council roundtable uh, that is um, uh, being sponsored by the Land Use Law Center at PACE, uh, I know, Laura, you'll be there tomorrow presenting on strategies that communities, communities can use to try to uh, address this concern. So we're dealing with it substantively, but also uh, trying to understand how that will help here with this project. So. Based on, on these two circumstances, uh, we have some initial recommendations that we're currently exploring. The first is to increase public awareness about the land development approval process and the roles of the building and planning departments. Um, first of all, ensuring that applicants have all necessary information to prepare and, prepare and submit their applications, along with understanding how the land development approval process works, are essential to an efficient process. Um, currently, the websites of both the planning department and building department do contain a lot of information, um, but there are probably a, a additional uh, pieces of information that could be put on those websites, again, that would be helpful as part of the public education process. So for both the building and planning departments, we're probably going to suggest that monthly reports that they often submit to you um, should be um, uh, posted on their respective web pages. So for example, uh, anyone who is interested in the workflow through the, the building department would understand the number of violations that they've gone out, complaints that they've investigated, inspections that they've done over the past month, and building department permit applications that they've had to review. Again, trying to understand the, the workflow and amount of work that is already happening here. Um, 
we would suggest that there are direct links to the Planning Board, Zoning Board of Appeals, Historic Preservation Commission, and Environmental Advisory Council meeting minutes. They are there, but you have to click through several links, and we would think it makes more sense to make them a direct link, again, to help that public information so that if someone has a question about an application that they're aware of was before a board you know, in, in the prior month, they're able to go and quickly get that information um, you know, by searching for that. Um, for the building department, we would probably suggest expanding the frequently asked questions um, to include information about legalizing prior construction projects, where they haven't been properly documented. Again, what's the process that they go through? Uh, and so that applicants are aware that, yes, um, I had a prior approval or I thought I had a prior approval. Now I have to go through the process of, of legally documenting that. How does that happen? Who, what do I have to do? And then for the planning department, um, they maintain uh, project department logs excuse me, project document logs, which show when applications are filed, when information requests were made, when those requests were responded to, um, and then when final approval occurred. And again, providing this information would help the public understand the process um, where you have applicants that are not being diligent in responding to information requests, uh, and again, understanding the workflow that happens uh, through the planning department. Um, Another recommendation would be developing a pamphlet that provides an overview of the land development approval process. So in addition to describing that process, uh, we would suggest probably flow charts illustrating some sample projects, typical projects like um, single family homes, two family homes, additions to an existing home, uh, decks and, and things of that nature. And then lastly, uh, we would probably recommend televising planning board and zoning board of appeals meetings um, as part of any effort to educate the public so that this way um, you know, for those who can't physically get to a meeting, but, you know, they have an opportunity to plug in, uh, they can do so and, and get that information um, with that. The other uh, significant um, recommendation at this stage is also increasing staff capacity for both the building and planning departments. Um, currently, the planning department right now consists of Valerie, um, as well as Beth as the secretary to the four boards. Um, in the past, as you're aware, the, the village has had an assistant planner. Um, Valerie serves as the central permit information desk for the land development approval process. So in addition to all the planning board, uh, board of architectural review, ZBA, historic preservation commission applications, she also has to review um, building department applications, most of them, uh, to see do they need other board approvals uh, to determine how uh, that workflow is going to happen. So in 2013, she reviewed a total of 168 building permit applications out of 281. Given the number of applications, the fact that she tries to make herself available um, to applicants for informational meetings uh, prior to submitting applications, we think uh, increasing capacity by bringing on a part-time or full-time planner uh, would be very useful, again, to help with that workflow. Um, and uh, this planner could also then, you know, attend Historic Preservation Commission meetings or Environmental Advisory Board meetings where a planner is not always able to get to. And that would then lend support uh, to those boards. Um, <clears throat> for, with respect to the building department, in addition to processing and reviewing building department applications, preparing enforcement cases, the building department also has to conduct all complaint, building, fire, plumbing, Section 8 housing, overnight parking, cabaret license, and refreshment license inspections. For 2013, taking all of those together, it was well over 3,500 inspections over the course of the year. Um, you know, on average, between a half hour and an hour. Some take longer. I think Al said today he had one inspection that took, you know, about two hours. Um, that starts to uh, take a significant amount of time. And then coming back to the office, downloading that information, preparing the necessary documentation, and then processing those. Um, one of the things where we think it would really help is maybe, for example, being able to uh, bring in an inspector just to do the fire inspections, which often take the most amount of time. Um, and so that will likely be one of our recommendations to the board. Other recommendations that we currently have under consideration and we just want to make you aware of, the first is increasing awareness of the architectural review guidelines. Right now, none of the applications for the various boards make reference to the architectural guidelines. We know a tremendous amount of time was spent developing those guidelines. They are very useful for both the Architectural Review Board and the Historic Preservation Commission. Matter of fact, they really are guiding principles. Those um, should be noted in the applications themselves and be made very prominent as part of the development process. 
Um, we should consider, or you should consider consolidating land development approval applications and integrating seek reforms uh, with those consolidated applications. In many cases, applications require the same information. Um, and so where multiple applications might be required on a development approval project, you know, it makes sense to probably try to see how we can bring those applications together and streamline that process. That's something we are going to continue to investigate um, over the next month and we'll make final recommendations on along with probably a sample application. Um, we would suggest considering expanding the Board of Architectural Review exemption list. So currently the BAR exempts several project types from review, including construction <coughs> of rear or side yard decks, in kind replacements and additions or deck enclosures in the rear or side yard, less than 100 square feet. Um, we are thinking about suggesting that you know, a certain threshold be set, maybe it's 300 square feet, 200 square feet, um, and also, uh, excuse me, I take that back, exempting any zoning code compliant addition so that it's within the setbacks regardless of size that that would be exempt from BAR review and also looking at the possibility of, of recommending um, exemption of single, single family and two family home structures where those homes are located outside of any of the historic districts. Again, these are just things we're exploring and want to bring to your attention. Then considering expanding the secret type two list. Uh, as you know, type two projects are exempt from secret review. Where an action is unlisted, um, there is the opportunity to look at those types of actions and pull them into a type two list. Uh, we will be working up recommendations on that. And then lastly, consider phasing in electronic submission requirements for larger projects. We would suggest this as a pilot initiative uh, where the Board of Trustees um, would consider electronic submissions for mixed-use projects, commercial projects that exceed a certain size threshold, um, and residential subdivision applications um, <clears throat> of more than three homes. This will require, however, that any meeting room over at the Austin Operations Center be wired properly uh, with a large screen TV to help facilitate those electronic submissions and review. So again, these are just some initial recommendations and thoughts that we wanted to share with you based on the work to date. We're about two thirds of the way again through our information gathering phase. We do have more work to do. We'll then be continuing to digest that information um, and working with both the planning departments and building departments um, as well as the engineer in the future to um, uh, bring that information together and uh, present that in a final report to you all by the end of June. That's so terrific. if you have any questions, we'd be happy to take them now or if, however you want to handle it. Yeah, he has questions. <laughs> Uh, I'm well. like yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I want to just uh, thank you for um, the, uh, the level of detail that, that you're able to provide us uh, here at the meeting, obviously subject to um, conversations with the individuals that would be impacted um, by the recommendations that you're making. Um, uh, you know, there's some good news here, and then there's some other news that where we need to kind of take a look at stuff. So um, I, I listen very carefully to many of the recommendations, they all sound very, very interesting. Um, I'm glad to hear that um, we're sitting in a good place in relationship to our neighbors. I'd like to see us uh, kind of raise that up uh, so people realize that people are getting through the process here in Austin um, as good or better than uh, many of our neighbors in terms of, you know, the whole process of, of getting permits and things like that. But uh, thank you for your work so far. I appreciate you what you've done. Mm -hmm. Um, Jeff, thank you very much for all the work um, that you have done, and, and I thank the department heads for the time that they have spent with you and give you that, that, that information that you require to do this analysis. A um, couple of things that I actually, uh, from the last time, uh, you know, I was part of, um, of one of you, you, your interview process, so to speak. Um, if you don't mind, take a look at uh, Nord Castle. Uh, and what they do there, and, and it's interesting. You kind of brought up a, a point. One, one of the major issues that, that I guess a lot of people have is, you know, the process. They don't like to go through the process. If they say this, and you brought up a good point where you said this, there's a criteria that you have to meet if it's less than 300 square feet, and you meet this, you don't have to go to zoning board. You don't have to go uh, maybe to a planning board in some occasions as well. Um, North Castle. Yeah, North Castle, what they do is they actually, um, they don't have a, plan, a residential planning board, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. What they do is they have the planner, the building department, 
uh, the build inspector, the engineer, uh, the head of the planning board, the head of the zoning board, they meet, I believe, once a month in the review applications. And that may be something that we can take a look at it, if anything. Uh, I'm not okay. sure if, I, I don't know if it, how it works or if it works. Um, a uh, couple of the things, you actually um, brought up a lot of technology that we need to be updated in, in, in our facilities to provide. You, you actually mentioned televised our meetings. I believe that was brought up a couple of times in the past as well. Yes. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I want to say two weeks ago, I spoke to actually Craig, our tech support uh, guy here, and he informed me that believe within a month, so I'm assuming it's coming up pretty quick, maybe in the next two weeks, we're going to be having all that technology up in the in, in boardroom, up in the planning room, uh, in the planning board area. So uh, I think that part is going to be covered. I also believe, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Al, which is a code enforcement uh, director, uh, we have tablets, I believe. So that part of when they're doing the inspections, I believe that could be covered within, within that so they don't have to, when they go back to the office, they just pretty much download all the information they have collected mm -hmm. collected, and, 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 and while they're doing the inspections. Cool. So a lot of the stuff we are doing, and, and I do agree, some of the forms, I believe, uh, they've been working on it, and hopefully before the end of the year or by the end of the year, we'll have a whole brand new uh, type of set of applications and, and yes I agree with you even though we do have the architectural guidelines and um, I know for a fact that whenever they, they, they go and get the applications they're given a copy or they're in, being informed but yes they're, they don't a lot of that stuff they don't reference to an, an application so I think that that's definitely a good idea um, the submissions in regards to um, to the PDF format electronic um, I think definitely for big projects but that to me is more like an additional that should be a copy besides the hard copies that they will have to submit mm -hmm. as, a, as yeah. for record so that's something that you know I guess uh, we have talked to Valerie I have talked to her about in regards to that so hopefully that will be going through um, the other item that um, I'm not sure if this is going to be part of this or not but we have talked about I know we do announcements where the public meeting goes um, every month the submission is done you know either through our email uh, e-blast or the newspaper but we also were talking about uh, projects that are big projects and large projects where a sign should be placed at that site with that information um, you know with date the meeting date um, you know where they're going to be located maybe like a rendering or an elevation of that project that is going to be happening in there so actually people that because people get do they do get mail but a lot of people they just get like a what's a 300 foot radius I believe mm -hmm. so if you don't live within 300 foot radius you don't get that mail so but if you're driving if you are interested to see what's going on in the project now you're going to see that so right. that's something that we talked about so i think that's something that we definitely need to bring that up right. uh, and we should that should be part of this whole process mm -hmm. um you know the reports being online uh, being just a direct link i think that's a, that definitely is a great idea I, um, i'm sorry to interrupt yeah um i think also having the the project document logs yeah. for the more significant projects Correct. again available directly online and I know Valerie has already started posting yes. some of that project information but I think again that will go a long way to helping the public know what is happening um, you know, with the property address and, and again being Correct. able to then provide the necessary links where it's appropriate. Correct. So I, I think that all those um, you know in regards to the applications you know and, and, uh, there's a bunch of different um, municipalities uh, the other one that comes to mind is Ellsworth. Ellsworth, you brought up, you know, when you want to legalize something, they actually have a link when it says uh, basements, a finished basement or legalized basements. Uh, you know, then different municipalities have different ways to, to do those things. So there are information that we can actually use that uh, in our favor and just 
I don't want to say copy those things, but actually use it as a template and modify it as, as, as we need to. So they are in a green board actually um, in their website, and I think it's part of the GIS uh, link, where it actually has the log of all the properties that are in violation. So you can go look, all the properties have different violations and what type of violations they have. Um, but that's, you know, so that's, that's something different. Um, and, that, and I think that's a lot of work for you for now, I guess. It's a lot for us, too. Once, uh, <laughs> so, around for that. You know, that's, uh, that's something that, I, you know, I had, I had in mind that I was doing the research um, before, so. Thank you. But, yeah. Victoria? Okay. Do you want to speak, Bob? Go ahead. Um, I just have one quick item to, uh, to ask about. You mentioned, and I see that we have one of our, our, our architects um, here in the room with us, um, that you've reached out to some of the local developers and folks who have worked from the other side. And um, I wondered if you'd reached out to the Chamber of Commerce and asked if they have any local business owners or folks who have um, worked uh, in our downtown and had, you know, what their experience has been with the process. Um, I'm going to now forget the gentleman's last name who came to the meeting uh, on May 1st. Jerry, he's a real estate he, yep, thank yes. you. Uh, Jerry. Um, so I had an opportunity to speak with him, uh, actually one-on-one -on -one for okay. about 45 minutes and to get his information. He also provided us with written comments mm -hmm. um, that we will include as part of uh, our report. Um, but had that opportunity to speak with him, and I know he has been involved with the Chamber of Commerce in the past. Um, as, as one, but we have not specifically reached out to them currently as part of the process yet. Yeah. Microphone, please. <laughs> um, for the public meetings, I specifically had Ingrid uh, send out on her email lists uh, the two public announcements for the two public meetings and what the public meetings are about. And uh, I made sure and I double checked with her, but in that list, the Chamber of Commerce was um, identified along with all the other different brokers and mm -hmm. business owners and, and that she has in the downtown. So we made sure we. Uh, included them in the process. Okay, great. They haven't yeah. reached out to you? Do you have, have you seen well, anything from any any of the organizations? I mean, I, I know you, it was mentioned that it wasn't, there weren't that many people at, the, at those Right, at we, those sent out the, we sent out the flyers yeah. to, I actually asked Ingrid to send out the flyers. Uh, she sent it out twice, actually. Okay. And, uh, and then we had a list of, we gave them a list of uh, 12, I think, different stakeholders that included architects, it included developers, and it included um, what was some that? contractors. Any, any email back? Any feedback? Any well, it, I'll turn it over to him. Yeah, them. please. Yeah, and Omar Herrera from the uh, chamber is, is here tonight, so. Uh, we'll public yeah. Right, so, so clearly, you know, the word has gotten out, mm -hmm. and uh, it would be good if you interfaced with him because he's a pretty smart fella. Great, and we certainly will. Yeah. Raise um, your hand, Omar. Look at him. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Yeah, we, we reached out to a number of architects, developers, um, as well as attorneys, land use attorneys. Uh, we have gotten, uh, I've had both phone conversations and we've gotten um, uh, email responses. Again, we're going to compile all that information as part of this report, um, this assessment report that we'll provide to you. Um, for the most part, those that we've spoken to, again, have really been uh, commending the village on the way the process works. Um, there are a few, um, a few stakeholders who have some concerns. I'm going to have some follow-up meetings with them uh, to better understand what the issues really are at the heart of, of um, you know, their, their concern about the process or, or comments about the process. So that is still ongoing. That's kind of the last third of the process, information gathering that we need to, to complete. Um, but we're trying to make sure that we're getting you know, word out about the project and get the public input, stakeholder input that we think is necessary to make sure that you have um, an appropriate assessment of what needs to occur here in the village. Good, thank you. Kaya, you have a comment? Thank you. Don't go anywhere, Jeff. Uh, Kaya, again, member of the Historical Commission. Uh, we were, had the pleasure of having a meeting with you to discuss and uh, voice our concerns, and we heard many of them were uh, put into your report, which is the more better interaction between the different boards and, and uh, advisory boards that we have. One of the things that you did mention that brought a little bit of a concern uh, to me and I think would be on my fellow uh, commissioners' uh, agenda is 
increasing uh, or allowing uh, modifications and or additions to private homes in the village without, of a certain size without a review. Osning is a very, very particular and very unique village in that we have major and large areas of the village and the neighborhoods of the village that have 60, 75, 80 percent of their unique historical fabric intact. Many of these areas are not in the historical district and that has more to do with the ability to name and mark an area, a historical a district. It's a very lengthy process and in the commission, we have uh, been focusing on very particular areas that we knew that we could handle. And we are very ambitious about trying to get other areas of the village under that curfew, on that purview, including Ellis Place. Uh, it could even be Waller. It could be a number of other, it could be Linden. There are many, many streets that have a unique fabric of houses that sometimes have undergone uh, changes that we think are um, regrettable, whether it's a repair of a railing that is now no, no longer what it originally was, or a fence or a stone gate in front by the, by the sidewalk, which is not in keeping with the style of the house nor the style of the area. So for us, it, I think it is a very important thing that those that we don't go rampant on letting that happen. It already is happening, and I know it's happening because the building department just, just does not have the manpower to go and patrol the streets like our parking people do. They're doing a magnificent job right now, by yeah, the way. I got a ticket the other they day. Yeah, I get right one every here. day, and it took two <laughs> days, and I'm in the parking lot now. But if we had if we had code enforcers of that nature, if we could afford that with the building department, we would have all these, uh, you know, things that are happening that are not being uh, documented, that not being stopped, or doesn't follow the process, uh, actually go through the process. And so my recommendation is, is not to allow an opening of additions and alterations to houses on the exterior without a review board. Thank you. I think we'll take that into consideration. I think ultimately the village board is going to have to decide which of these to implement. Uh, and that is something that we clearly have to look at. We're all aware of uh, many of those things. I live in an historic district, and whenever anything is jarringly wrong, um, it, it is jarringly wrong. So yeah. it's, um, Thank you very much, Jen. Do you, do you have? Oh, I'm, oh, sorry. You have another uh, board I'm member. I'm sorry, here. I thought you said you didn't. So no. Go ahead, please. Hi. Uh, thank you for all your hard work. Uh, thank you. I was speaking to someone who has a job with the uh, city of New York, and he is a project expediter. And I thought, I love that. What do you do? And he told me that he he gets assigned. There's a group of them, and they get assigned to large projects to help them essentially navigate the rocks and shoals of the path to uh, get a project approved. And I thought, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing for Osning? Are there other communities smaller than the city of New York that have such a position? And has it been successful? Do you know? Um, that is something that we are exploring. I can tell you that Valerie really plays that role right now on yeah, but, behalf of the but village. But there's only one of her. I, I understand. I know. And, and that, and that know. is an issue. And again, that goes back to the staff capacity concern that, mm -hmm. that we identified. Um, but as again, as part of now moving into our assessment phase and kind of doing a bring down from the um, uh, national review that we've been undertaking on these streamlining projects, that is something that we will, you know, consider uh, Good. And, and certainly look at and have looked at in the past. We know, for example, in the project that we did in Newburgh, that was one of the recommendations to create a one-stop uh, shop, if you will. Um, so there was an entree point into the process, and then that person served or would serve as an expedited role that hasn't been implemented yet, but is still under consideration for Newburgh. Good. Second question, or, or idea. Uh, some, of, some of the property owners here uh, have projects that they're waiting to do. 
And perhaps some of those people, if, if you spoke to them now before they start their projects and, and talk to them about their concerns, that would be useful. For example, uh, the folks who own Westerly Marina down at the waterfront, uh, they've got a plethora of things going on there. They've got storm mitigation that they have to do. Um, they have to raise the, the floor in one of their buildings to, up to grade to stop it from flooding every time there's a storm. Um, they're going to be putting in some retail and perhaps a restaurant or I think a brewery in another part of their, their facility. And they just purchased uh, a warehouse next, that's adjacent to their property that they would like to develop. So there's a lot of different kinds of projects coming out of one uh, business owner. And the, the folks at Westerly might be good people for you to talk to uh, because they're doing so many different kinds of things. Uh, and I know because you don't have enough to do. I figured I'd give you that. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. As and, a case study to be. Yes, and I did want to, to say that it's really good to hear that compared to other communities we are doing so well because I know we are understaffed in the planning department and they, you know, Valerie does extraordinary work for us um, and we need to get her some help. This falls at uh, ex exactly the right moment in the year uh, for us to be looking at this because uh, Richard is already launched in with the department heads and the treasurer and some of us on, on the board has launched into next year's budget process. The governor has uh, got his foot on our neck uh, about 2% caps and 1% reduction of levies. Um, but we are at another extraordinary moment in that the village is really thriving at present. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of activity going on. Um, it would be uh, a reach to find uh, more staff, money for, for more staff, particularly under those circumstances. On the other hand, um, it would be uh, counterproductive perhaps not to. So I'm glad to hear that you are recommending that because it gives us an opportunity to see what the pros and cons of, of that are under the circumstances. Um, Avalon was an extraordinary experience for the, for the village. Um, I think I was there on day one when they brought in a, uh, their proposal and today I went and looked at the, uh, the finished cane house. Um, and what is this, two, two and a half years later? Uh, it's really quite an amazing thing. The fact that they were completely prepared for this and went through the system very quickly, I think despite the fact that it was a heavy load for Valerie and, and Al and the engineer, uh, it was a much lighter load than some of the other very big projects that we've had that have gone on for years and years and years. Uh, so I think the, the whole concept of uh, filling people in well in advance of their coming to us is a very good idea and how we approach doing that. I've always been an advocate of, of uh, uh, of televising the, the planning board and zoning board, and there's been a lot of resistance to that over the years. But there are these are new times, and uh, maybe it will uh, it will be good. There was resistance when we started televising these meetings, um, so I think that that's good. And this is excellent work. Thank you very much, uh, Jen. Do you have anything to add to this? Okay. When are you coming back? Tomorrow. He, uh, <laughs> he's going to talk to Paul in the morning. And, <laughs> and Omar. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, could you just make sure that Omar gets your business card before Absolutely. you leave so you can yeah. share it with the, yep. the chamber? Good. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you all very much for your time this evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The next item is a request uh, with respect to the, it would be the 18th annual Portuguese Fair, uh, proposed to be held on June 21st. I'll turn it over to Christina to introduce our uh, guest this evening. Certainly. So this evening we have Arlinda da Silva, who's representing the Portuguese Club with regard to the Portu annual Portuguese Festival. She's come here this evening um, to ask the board's permission for the fair. And there's two items that she wanted to address. One was um, she was hoping the board would approve an 11 p.m. end time. Although the technical start of the festivities is 10 a.m., it really, that's for um, 
that's for a small ceremony, but it really gets underway kind of after working hours, uh, the five or six o'clock, and she's asking for that additional time. And um, the second item was to have Spring Street, where it intersects with Main Street, close. So adjacent to the Market Square, they, um, as we've heard in the past, some other things, there's festivities on both sides of Spring Street, and there's a concern for safety with the kids and things like that, crossing back and forth. And so I'll turn it over to Arlinda, who's joining us here this evening. Good night. Um, I just wanted to ask everybody, uh, Christina said it all, um, this is my first time um, requesting this, but a 40-year member of the Portuguese club. Um, I'm very proud to be with the Portuguese heritage. We wanted to keep this uh, going on as long as we possibly could, as long as we're all still here and pushing for it. So I'm just asking for um, your blessing. Yeah, the, only, uh, um, the, the only question I, I would have is, um, you you want to just the, you want the part of Spring Street up to Maple, is that the section it's, that you're going to cut the, off, or how much are you going to? What happened last year was the part between the beginning of uh, is that State Street where the Portuguese Grill is, to right? The, to the, to Maine, it was not closed last year. Therefore, right. kids were crossing over to where Market Square is, and right. it became sort of a hazard situation for the children. Exactly. I think you're talking about Maple. That's kind of opposite the um, exit for the post office parking lot. That's, so I think it, she's talking about closing Spring Street from Maple. That's yeah. that corner. Yeah. Correct. Corner yeah. of Maple and Maine. Right. right. Okay. So, right. so that's the section that you're – so people would – so does that mean people will be able to use that road that, that, that goes by the post office? Correct. That'll, that, that'll Correct. Be. Not necessarily for vendors or anything of that nature, but for – safety for the kids because they do a go across mm. right. to, they used to have some uh, balloon, uh, I don't know, the guy with, uh, with for the rides uh, for children games, and that's sure. where he parked, and it became mm -hmm. sort of a, of a problem. Mm -hmm. the, the, the mass is on the uh, east side of that street. Mm -hmm. The mass uh, used to be held uh, on the market square after the yeah. farmer's market was over. Yeah. This year we're going to hold it in the parking lot earlier in the day, ah. mm -hmm. yeah, if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, sure. No, I just, I guess I wanted uh, just a clear yeah. delineation of how much of, uh, how much of the street that you wanted. I mean, generally when we, when we ask for this, we sort of get like a little map, you know, yeah. just to draw what, what you're asking for. And, uh, and I would just want that to reflect the decision. I don't have any problems with, with. Yes, uh, we're planning on um, meeting with representatives of the Portuguese club. She did submit um, a draft that was similar to previous years. Okay. And yeah, um, really we would sit down, you know, as a working meeting with the right. department heads to did, um, did, and then the take other, care of logistics. Uh, right. And then the other issue was you you want to you want to stay until eleven. Correct. And and, and what, what's our we, have we, here or we generally don't have uh, anything after ten um, downtown. Um, I don't know that we have approved. Have we approved anything after no. 10 o'clock downtown? So. I don't think so. No. The, the concern that I have for that is if we, we do it for the poor, I have no problem with it going to 11. I only have a problem with it if the next people who come to approve something, yeah, exactly. how do we tell them no? Yeah. And yeah. Um, I think the discussion needs to be, do we want to change the policy to 11? And I don't have a problem doing that, but I think that needs some discussion because I, you know, I'm not sure everybody agrees with me that 11 is okay, but if it's going to be okay, it has to be okay for everyone. The other thing, question I have is, uh, have you talked to Joe Burton, the chief of police, regarding closing the street? No, no. I, we thought that the, um, we would come here first to. Be okay. Right. When and, is, I'm sorry. Oh, before you, and again, I don't have a problem with closing the street. I think it's. I I, I like the idea that it. it's safer, and it it, it creates a very large. A safe space for an event. However, we have said no to others that have asked to do it. So again, it's the same question. I think that we should have a consistent policy. And if it was up to me, I would say yes, we should do both those things. Have it be open to I 11 and close, yes to, to close the street. And, right. I'm just I wanting to say that, okay. that uh, okay. if. I yeah. From previous years, it was yes. always closed. Last year was the only year okay. yeah. that uh, they did not close it. It just it just brought concern to parents, concern oh. to the community because of the kids. That's it's the my favorite reason. event, well, so I'm a, little, I'm, I'm a little biased. The Portuguese <laughs> Fair is my favorite event. I love the club. We do our, our, our Democratic Party election night there every year, uh, and you, you, you folks have been wonderful hosts. 
and uh, the Portuguese community in Ossining uh, contributes so much to the fabric of the success of this village. So uh, I wanted to say that, and I look forward to the event. You'll see me there. Very good. You're well, welcome. You'll see us all there, I yes, suspect. Sir. Very good, yes. We have invitations ready to go, but I didn't want to present anything <laughs> until today. <laughs> I want to make sure I'm on safe ground. <laughs> I'm a little concerned with the 11 o'clock, not just because if we say yes this time, it has to go for everyone else, but the more people living downtown, the more likely it is to interrupt their lives if we allow things to go to 11 o'clock. It's something we have to consider. There will be, uh, very shortly, there will be 31 more units online. <coughs> Uh, or two more in another building on, online. So it's something we have to consider. Uh, personally, if this were a, a one-shot thing and we were in the middle of a field somewhere, I have no problems. No, I understand. Uh, it's a residential so commercial area. It's it is. So we'll, we will discuss that uh, in terms of closing the street so long as it uh, is made possible for the uh, vendors at the farmer's market to exit so that the, it's not closed off yet. Uh, okay. When they are, uh, yeah, the timing of when we close off that that part may have to wait, you know, for, for the right. farmers market to end so they can the, properly the exit. Traffic. Otherwise, they'll be stuck there until Monday. We can't <laughs> have that. <laughs> As long the as farmers they have fresh fruit, it's all right. Yes. Um, <laughs> the heavier traffic doesn't happen until after three, four o'clock. So yeah. I'm not concerned about the early part of the day. Okay. You know, but I am concerned about the evening. Okay. Um, so, so, okay. So, so we can get back to yeah, it with this. I do have a couple of points. I don't know if yeah. uh, Victoria. Uh, and, and Thank you. Uh, actually, I've been in a Portuguese fair um, uh, as well. I, I, I do like summer fairs as well. Uh, I like mm -hmm. that a lot. Me too. Uh, been there too a couple times. Um, but, uh, but in the past, you know, uh, um, if you don't mind going forward, uh, maybe, I don't know how long I'm going to be here, but I guess but for the next board uh, members or for the future board itself, I think it would be nice to, to have, like uh, my colleague John mentioned, just a just a diagram. Okay, what we have that from the previous yeah, years. I, I'm glad, glad yeah, to if you present it. I mean, what what day is that? The the twenty first of June. Okay. It's the day mm -hmm. after the um, Asening. Um, Correct. The weekend. And the the weekend fair, after. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, if you bring a diagram, it will definitely help a lot. Okay. Um, the closing of the street, I'm okay with it. Uh, being okay, I think it helps um, for everybody. Eleven o'clock. I'm not in favor of that at all. I'm sorry. You know, it's just. Uh, safety issues for me personally. Uh, I think 11 o'clock is too late as is. Uh, but um, I'm just one member of the board. Uh, so, but I think it's a great event. So, are you going to be submitting the paperwork? With I will the, be with submitting the all the paperwork and everything else. Yeah, she, 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 yeah she submitted the um, she submitted the re original request. We've had initial meetings, and um, we are trying to schedule now mm -hmm. our the insurance. Our you head. will take care of that stuff and everything else. Good. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, I'll just briefly comment. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Portuguese festival. My grandmother is Portuguese, but um, I did not learn to speak the language when I was growing up, um, nor did I have nearly as much connection. We do connection. have a school. For yes. <laughs> so I've Actually, um, I, I, I've spoken to um, some of your organizers about possibly having my children attend uh, when they're a little bit older. So um, uh, I, I, I share some of the same concerns about the 11 o'clock, uh, primarily for uh, consistency with the other um, events that happen downtown. Um, and I think we have, um, most recently, I think Summerfest sometimes had Spring Street closed and sometimes didn't, but most recently did. Um, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't you know, it, yeah. I think we're, we're, we're moving yeah, into we're, that being yeah. more of a consistently uh, granted that works opportunity. For me. So. so can I, since they are trying to put their agenda on and uh, get their invitations uh, finalized, since our next work session is not for two weeks, are you prepared to make a decision tonight in terms yes. of the closing hour so yeah. they can go ahead? So I, I hear that. I think there are enough 10 o'clock people. Okay. Not yeah, so I, that I think for, for this year, closing yeah. the street is and okay and 10 yeah. o'clock. Okay, and then you can so always you, look you at the hours later, but at least they can go forward with their program yeah. for 10. Okay. Yes. Good. okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much, everybody. You're all welcome to come. And, um, Thank you. We we'll be there. Be there. Thank you. We'll be there. Yep. Bom noites. Okay, thank you. The next item on the agenda is uh, it is the uh, update on the status of the Kilbrook uh, project. The board uh, knows very well, and the public should know that the village is under a uh, mandate from the New York State Department of Environmental 
conservation to replace a sewer main that's over 100 years old. Uh, as part, and that is in the very bottom of the Kilbrook, which is the brook that runs uh, from the community center down to the Hudson River. Uh, as part of that project, which is well underway and we're right on schedule in terms of complying with the, D, with the DEC, there is an access capability that will allow our village workers to access the site and make any future repairs or adjustments that are necessary. And as part of that, uh, the village is able uh, to integrate that particular access to provide a recreational component. So when the project is complete, you'll be able to walk, you'll have handicapped access from behind the community center, which will also be augmented with a uh, terrace in the back of the pool uh, that's uh, held, assisted by the last of the CDBG monies. You'll be able to access by uh, handicap access from behind the community center, go down into the Kill Brook, and you'll follow the same path along the riverbed itself, which will take you out at this point in the original project at Central Avenue, it'll allow you to access through Central Avenue. As part of the um, uh, option uh, for this parcel, there was an opportunity to uh, to extend the access under the Central Avenue bridge and come out at a point uh, which is actually the old village DPW parcel. So uh, our engineer, Paul Ferrioli, is here with our uh, consulting engineer to update the board and uh, to uh, outline some of the options that you have. It's now time to uh, determine that last aspect of the program. So thank you. Thank you, Manager. Again, I'm with Joe Tremelli from Kellart Sessions, the principal engineer on this project. Subsequent to last meeting, when we asked for authorization for the additional borrow, which you actually approved at the last legislative session, thank you, the project balance is $5,008,000 presently. That will cover if all things go as planned, the necessary contingency for the project minus the alternate, the contingency, the testing, the soft cost, and the miscellaneous cost that we outlined in the last meeting. In this meeting, as the manager referenced, we'd like to give you a very brief project update because we, a lot does happen in the two, two weeks since we were last here. We've reached out for the DEC again um, with, a formal, uh, with our formal monthly notification of where we are with the project status. And um, just as recently as yesterday, we sat and had a, a very lengthy project meeting with the general contractor on this job, and um, he reassured us that the schedule is intact and we should have no problem presently with meeting the DEC consent order. So that brings us to today and what we referenced at the last meeting, which was, as requested, a further investigation of the options that we can um, perform um, versus just not awarding the alternate, what we can do to possibly reduce the alternate and bring it into a more manageable financially and constructability scope. So subsequent to that, um, the manager and I and our consultant engineer did walk the creek and view the project as a whole and also to assess the alternate as it stands today and the alternate as it may stand um, uh, as a reduced alternate um, that would still give us the same, as the manager explained, detail of bringing us out of the Kilbrook to the other side of Central Avenue and give us a, um, a vista view, if you will, of what you know will eventually hopefully be a developable lot and still uh, maintain the handicap accessibility mm -hmm. Um, as a turnaround versus a continuation. This proposal that I'm going to let Joe detail in a little more does, um, is in, in conjunction with the stairs that also still go up to Central Avenue, which will give you a thoroughfare to the waterfront, if you will, um, through the newly landscaped Central Avenue, which has new sidewalks and uh, decorative street lighting along that that takes you down to the same, it deposits you on the same uh, section of Water Street that, you know, the path, should it be extended um, by us or a developer one day, would if, uh, if that project um, takes place. So, um, again, we sat collectively and we think what the most prudent option at this point is, so we don't do anything short-sighted with a potential development, and I'm going to remind everybody that um, what I'll get into with Jeff, as we talked about so much, um, from PACE and what Joe does 
together with myself is we do review the site plans that come in for large scale projects like that. Um, so already in this RFP is uh, stormwater work that um, addresses some of the flow down to the Hudson, that's tributary to the Hudson. And um, we will have the ability to also um, levy our druthers for that stormwater and the path mm -hmm. through the site if it if it if is really deemed appropriate at the time. So that's a conversation for another day. So today, again, getting back on track, we think the most prudent approach is a reduced alternate right now that offers an overlook. And we picked out a spot when we did our walk that we think is really the most feasible from a construction standpoint and also takes you to a point in the lot that does give you a vista of the entire lot should we decide to do something in the interim between development and whatever that may be. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the technical components of that path. And then I'm going to come back after Joe explains that and talk to you about some of the costs associated with what he has to say. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Good evening. Hi, Welcome, Joe. Joe. Nice to see you all again. Um, so as you know, as, as Paul just explained, that the base contract, the path extends from the, the rec center with a, a ramp, ramped access down to the Kilbrook and uh, follows a path to Central Avenue uh, with stair access to Central Avenue. Uh, the alternate was to uh, continue that ramp underneath the Central Avenue overpass, ultimately ending in the village uh, property, a parcel on the uh, north side of the Kilbrook. That was some initial thinking during the design and uh, initial planning um, to end that path and extend it to that parcel well, at the time with thinking uh, continuation of a path. More recently, after walking the brook with the village manager and, and not knowing the, the future of that par parcel, it was thought uh, it'd be better suited to, to do the alternate, but not extend it all the way down. We, we thought we would end it, uh, but it's about 225 feet shy of the original termination point. There uh, is sort of a flat landing area, if you will, uh, prior to, just prior to the existing access road from the village parcel into the Kilbrook that they currently use for maintenance. Uh, so the thought was we would extend the, the ramp underneath Central Avenue. Uh, it would end up about 150 feet south of the Central Avenue overpass and it would terminate at a, uh, a landing or platform. It would be elevated probably 10 to 12 feet above existing grade. And with that location where it is, you end up with a, a nice view shed of the, the remaining channel down to North Water Street um, and then into the, the parcel that would hopefully be developed in the future. And then at that, that termination point would be designed in such a way that it could be continued with at a future date with a similar style ramp and walkway to whichever side of the stream made sense at that time. Uh, as you see here in our original plan, we had a stream crossing at the south end of the ramp. Uh, that may or may not be desired down the road. Um, so again, we thought taking it back at 200 feet or so to this point gave you the, the, uh, the alternate constructed beyond Central Avenue into the village property, uh, which made sense from a, a logistics standpoint, and then gave you the freedom and the option in the future on, as to how you wanted to extend it and what side of the stream to bring it to. Uh, the um, there's one other thing I want to mention. Uh, as far as logistics go, the contractor, just so you know now, uh, the pipe has been fully lined uh, with regard to the consent order. And the encasement is, uh, there was about 1,200 feet of pipe that had to be encased. He is now encased upwards of 800 feet or so. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's well underway in completing, well under the time allotted. Uh, so that encasement is, just about at this manhole here. Uh, and he's drilling rock anchors for the piers that support the walkway. And he's almost complete with that work for the base contract. So rather than, uh, if, if timing were ideal, he could simply just move his operation into the alternate and continue with that, that operation, the, the foundations and the piers and Great. the concrete work. Uh, so I'll leave that to you. And maybe you want to add something here. Um, maybe, maybe you want to like show this to the audience because we're sort of talking okay. theoretically here. And, and All right, and then we'll pass it around so you can see it a little right. closer too. People would have to turn around and go back the other way. 
you know, yes yes at that point the or they or they can just uh, leave out of the stairs and we're going to pass this around while i'm going over some of the numbers camp there until they develop that area but in short what joe was saying more eloquently the contractor needs to know are we continuing yeah. we're at that point i know we talked about it for the last few months but now after our last meeting he, are we doing it or are we not doing it so that's kind of where we're at with him okay well, I like the uh, idea of if we're going to end it there, at Thanks, least it's Chuck. going to be a platform with a view for, of the rest of the of the kill and out yeah. towards yeah. the Hudson. Um, okay, so as we're it's, it's really a matter of whether or not we're going to go that far, and if we are going to go that far, do we want to stop there? I, I well, I mean, there's a number of options where Paul's going to take some finances. Yeah. If you do okay. nothing, then you have to get a five million dollar contract. You just don't have to build anything at all. Okay. If you want to do, yeah. If you do nothing, you're at a five million dollar contract. It's done. If you do the uh, the other, the original option A, it's going to take you back up to Central Avenue on the other side. He's got a number on that, and then uh, he's going to present you with some numbers for the other alternatives. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, where we stand right now, again, is five million eight thousand dollars. The alternate, as it originally exists in the contract documents, was a five hundred and Seventy-nine thousand plus or minus dollar alternate, not inclusive of um, any soft costs or additional costs that we discussed that were attributable to the other path, like the railing, et cetera. Um, uh, so that's how much that would cost if we decided let's build what's in the contract. But I think that's, I think that's we all the original, that's right? the original, right? But I just take it all the way down to where it, it connects to Central Avenue, correct, via the, the stairs. Which I think um, it, it's safe to say that. DPW and the manager's office are all in agreement that we're not really going to consider that because that's not prudent now at this time. So the alternate anymore. Alternate alternate. All right. So the reduced alternate, which we talked about just now, which creates the overlook, um, we believe that with the money that you extended already for the railing, we can try to incorporate some of the soft cost in the railing into that alternate price where we won't have to because this number that I just told you, or I'm about to tell you is inclusive of the entire alternate. What would it be? So we have, um, <laughs> I'm getting there. It's, uh, we're, we're, reducing, we're reducing the alternate by approximately 450 feet. Okay? okay. So it's basically a 35 to 36% reduction in the scope, but it works out to be more of a 39 or 40% reduction in the cost, where it's a $225,000 plus credit to the 579 where we can accomplish the reduced alternate with the overlook for 354,000. Now, that um, that alternate uh, contingencies and soft costs we hope to absorb with what you already gave us. That's okay. kind of where we're at. Again, it, we're only saying that with confidence because we are so far along with the project, um, and and things are going uh, fairly uh, smoothly. Um, we hope that it stays that way. Yeah, I, I think it's really important that we don't stop and go up the staircase and that be the end of it. I think that at least to that point is is uh, how big is the turnaround? Yeah, good. I agree. Well, the turnaround we haven't formally designed the turnaround. We kind of think we're just going to kind of figure something out in the field that does give the uh, the the the, the feeling of a turnaround versus a dead end. Um, we also want to make it accessible. I mean, it, we could dead end it right now because it's wide enough to be appropriate for a, a wheelchair to turn around and, and uh, with, the, with the appropriate radius, but we want to make it a little more grandiose, so we'll see. Um, and we'll come back to the manager's office with specifics before it gets built. Cool. We are going to also build it to, if and when, uh, extend. So we're going to, you know, we're going to do the necessary um, uh, doweling and make it uh, connectable um, to... And you say that's 200,000 something? 200? Uh, 354 was the number that we actually just, and that's not an estimate. That's what the that's what the contractor has agreed in a okay. will be a proposed change order. As opposed, to I'm sorry, a reduced order. Yeah, 79. yeah. It's about a 225 thousand dollar reduction to the alternate amount. So if you award the alternate, then you would just reduce it by that amount. I think we're looking at uh, one point in tax. Now, of course, this is often bonded so it doesn't work quite that way yeah. but it is one point tax yeah. for two employees 
Um, and I think actually stopping it there with the savings is a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Well, at, using that as a segue, I'll tell you that we have talked about this again with Richard and Tom with this new reduced amount. And the what we have to discuss tonight is the funding source because this really truly now is because it will be an elevated overlook that doesn't really provide for access. There, it's not really uh, defendable from the sanitary sewer fund. It will really be a um, a general or rec fund decision. Is there enough money in the rec fund? Make. How high? How high is that going to be? Like, right now, as it as it sits post? right now on the on the existing virgin grade, which we'll take it back down to when everybody pulls out of the job and we get rid of the access road, et cetera, it'll approximately be nine feet off the 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 elevation of the platform will be about nine feet off the ground. Hey. Tom, is there money for this in the uh, in the rec fund? rec fund? Yeah, there is. Yes. And we have over five hundred thousand dollars. In that the, case, uh, in the rec, uh, in the rec yeah. fund. So I think well, that's where so it's going. Yeah. Do I mean, we, we do have some rec projects coming up, though. So, so do, do, do we, we need that? That, 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 that takes yeah. out all that, the one sixty so that we're spending on the. the do we need part. we wow. need to do a vote tonight on this? Well, yeah, I mean, census. Census. Oh, yeah. so it's a bobblehead. It's one of these. Yeah. Well, discussion census. Yeah. I'll just add my two cents because everybody knows that I think this is something that's so valuable for the community and um, the bang for a buck that we get for this because there's so much infrastructure in place right now because we had to do the work for the DC for the sanitation and sewer line. Um, that to extend it now for the 354 is so much more affordable than if um, somebody wanted to come in later on and we hadn't gone past the Central right. Avenue right. side. So um, it really is, I think, a very wise investment, and I'm delighted. Great. And and the position that is being suggested right now offers a lot of flexibility for how that space might be used if um, it were to be developed in the future. So thank you very much for. Yeah. Um, everybody who went back and forth and considered what might work. I think yeah. this is if great. It, if we never do go beyond that, we could put a catapult there so that people could get up easily. Ah! No, we were going to put in one of those three-four. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, the zip lines. So, yeah, the actually, zip I would love to have a zip line. Let's talk about the liability with that. What's the gross number now? 354. Oh, yeah, actually, that was my yeah. only other question, Lori Lee. Do we have any update on the easements related to this? I got a written update on the easements the other day. I have one almost done. Okay. So we should finish this. Okay. So yeah. I agree with Victoria. Uh, I think we should move forward. Yes. So anybody else? Yes. That's three. So, but the number is $75. The, 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 yeah, the total board. project That's, cost. Okay. Okay. Total project cost will be 5362000 Okay. Plus. Okay, so I think I think that we have a consensus. Just, uh, just put like a glass floor so you can see down, you know, that kind of stuff. And a toll. Right. Can we have a toll? We actually have a crossing that is, uh, you can do the street measurement. Really? Oh, very cool. Oh, that's great. Uh, okay. I still have my Next. So uh, thank you for uh, responding so affirmatively, and I thank uh, Paul and our engineer, our consultant, uh, for their availability and flexibility. So, so thank you. Next. Now Next. You <coughs> That's the plan. Use a few more dollars. Yeah, That's, always. That's always the plan. Okay. Put a hot, thank you, Paul. Thank you put a hot tub Thanks, at the Paul. end. Then. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you. The yeah, at the end, a hot tub and a bar. And the catapult. And the catapult. Okay, so the next item is uh, the board recalls that um, bids have been put out for to see about the uh, ability to install a new, uh, larger generator at the operations center to deal with. Uh, the potential during storms and also at the Indian Brook Reservoir uh, because of the uh, storm that we experienced two or three years ago where we, we were out power for close to a week. It became sort of a critical situation. So it was a very high priority to try to get a, um, an updated, modern, expanded generator at the Operations Center. And uh, I beg your pardon, at the Indian Brook, at the Operations Center, we actually were able to keep that operation going under the existing conditions, but we didn't have the backup power. So before I turn it over to Andy, I think you've had an opportunity to review the information. Uh, the one bid at the uh, Indian Brook came in a little higher than originally anticipated. So uh, the one at the Operations Center came in at or slightly below. So as you uh, consider the alternatives, uh, you know, you always have the alternative to award both bids, to award one. You know, I would just say if there's an option, 
we might hold back on the operations center a little bit. We, uh, we could survive that. I think the Indian Brook is very important. But um, I just see that as an option as we're always trying to, you know, save money and, you know, we can always do projects as we go along, but we can't always do them all at once. So with that, I'll turn it over to Andy. For those of us who, uh, who worked through the storms uh, not terribly long ago, the operations center is, uh, is important to the people who work there. Um, the Indian Brook is important to 35,000 people. So I think there's no question we need to, to go ahead with that one. The question is whether we do the other one as well. Yeah, I'll just give a little update. Hello, everybody. Um, originally, a couple of years ago, when we looked at the situation with the generator at the plant, the initial um, design that we wanted to go with was an 800 kW generator. And that, was, that would be sufficient to actually run the plant fully that we are designed for right now. But since we did this water, we, we signed on for the water alternative study and um, met with Hazen and Sawyer, it looks like, you know, preliminarily that if we are to expand in the future, it's going to be expanding at Indian Brook. So the last thing you'd want to do is put a generator in that would not run the plant fully. Okay. So before we went out to bid, we asked the design engineer, bring that, that size up to 1,000 kW, which would handle our future needs. So originally when I looked at the budget, we, um, we budgeted 750000 So this, when this generator came in, it came in at 897000 And um, the situation at the operations center, we budgeted that generator at 225 and that came in at 166. Um, during the storms, the plant was out of power for 11 days. The operations center and that same situation was out for five days. So it's... Um, it's going to be strictly a board decision. Obviously, the plant we, we need no matter what. Mm -hmm. It's just. I think we need both no matter what. I think this is not the time. Uh, we, we've had a bunch of storms. We're going to have more storms. That's the way the, way the climate has changed. Uh, I think that it's, I think everybody agrees that we have to do the one at the plant. That's, you know, but I think that the operations center, it's really important that the people who, come out in the storms and do the work, you know, who risk their lives um, um, and keep the rest of the village running, they deserve to be able to have that, have that power. And uh, so I'm in favor of this is not the place to save money. I think we should do this and we should do it now. Manuel? What was the difference again, Sandy, in between those two? Um, the original design budget for the filter plant was 750000 Because we had to increase it from 800 no, kW no, no, to 1000 What was the other one? The other one was originally, uh, the budgetary price was 225 and that came in at 166 So like the manager said, one came in higher, one came in lower. Yeah. The difference of what was bonded, Tom has that information, if you wanted him to talk about it, but... Um, I can do it right now. Do you want? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, good evening. Um, the uh, two bids together a total one million sixty-four thousand dollars. That was the eight hundred ninety-seven thousand five hundred and the one hundred sixty-six thousand nine hundred dollars, and the bond resolution that was um, adopted by the board back in February uh, for the two projects was $975,000. So we were looking for $89,400 additional um, funding source. Um, we could certainly um, just appropriate fund balance in the water fund. The water fund has been very healthy, um, and including in uh, 2013 as well. Um, or we could go back and ask bond council for um, a modification to the bond resolution. Okay. I think it would not hurt us to take it from the fund. Um, it is, after all, why we have such monies in reserve. And the less we lay on to the future generations for paying, the better. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, my, also, my understanding also is that we've received communications from Sing Sing Prison in which they've um, made some ovations about um, possibly helping us out with this. Is that correct, Richard? Yeah, probably in the neighborhood of seventy-five thousand in the best of all. Right. Numbers. So, so we're we're going to get some help there. Um, the good news is, is we we budgeted two twenty-five and we came in at one sixty, um, which I think is uh, obviously we're we're at a savings there. Um, and I also think that uh, um, I agree with Andy that, you know, if we're going to raise capacity at the water plant, that we need to have uh, a piece of equipment that's appropriate for the future and not for the present. The other thing I'd like to say about the operations center is that, you know, not only is it the place where our workers are, but it's also, you know, it's also an emergency location. It's also a place where if if people needed to go and go to a warm place or a place where, you know, there's other things that are going to happen. This is the reason I want the fire department to make sure that all the firehouses have uh, generators as well because, you know, these are emergency locations. If people are having difficulty with loss of power and they need a, a place to stay, just like our community center, um, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen uh, when, we, when these natural disasters happen. And the more uh, support and infrastructure we have to to take care of our citizens, I think that's really important. So I, I'm in favor of, of uh, raising the bond amount. Uh, the, can we pay for the whole thing out of the water fund? Is that the, is the that 89,000? The, yeah. the 89 additional. That we were going to bond the whole thing through the water department. Is that what you're saying, Tom? Um, or we were just going to bond the. You know, the, the, the portion at the operations center that's attributable to general fund operations should pay for a, a portion of the um, bond. Okay. Um, the, the bond resolution was just passed as a bond resolution of the village as a whole, and, okay. then, and then we budget to the respective funds okay. of the, the debt service payments. Okay. We get it. Okay. So do we, what do we do now? Just a consensus, I think. Victoria? Um, Yeah, I feel similarly to my colleagues, and um, obviously, uh, like it, like it was stated, the having clean, fresh, functioning water to uh, all the residents is extremely important. Especially those of us who lost power for quite some time, about a week with Superstorm Sandy. It's good to know that you have clean water. Um, but uh, there are any number of storms that require all major demands on all the people who work in the operations center, and we need them to be able to function at their best. Um, and uh, so I, I trust Tom's ability to account as frugally and carefully as possible for how we would come up with the other 89,000 or and the entire project. Okay. So that's the I'd like to see it from the bar as opposed to adding the Right. It's going to be, yeah, yeah, um, from my perspective, I'd rather take it from the water fund because we're talking about the larger generator at the Indian Brook uh, water fund. Uh, yeah. right. Okay. Sounds good. Right. So. Thank you. Okay, great. So we're good to go with that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next item is uh, we've been speaking about um, different potential legislation. Uh, this is actually the first pass at this. Um, yeah, the board will recall that this is dealing with uh, housing, uh, the perceived overcrowding, uh, the older housing stock being able to regulate as best we can the uses, and. Uh, so we're taking, we shared a number of possible other local laws that other municipalities have had. Uh, the board gave the go ahead to, for us to investigate. It's sort of on the peak scale model, which uh, one local law requires that on any transfer of property, a new certificate of occupancy is required. Uh, the second local law would provide for landlord registration of all uh, rental apartments, properties. So we'd be able to have that contact point for landlords and also it gives you an additional information mm -hmm. source uh, in terms of what's going on with your properties. In addition, at the most recent uh, work session, the board authorized uh, the preparation of a local law to remove the three bedroom maximum requirement exemption for uh, okay. residential. So we'll be working on that at, at, as well. So this is a three prong approach. That would be one of three tonight or the two others. And as uh, Lori Lee and uh, Jeff alluded to tomorrow, Lori Lee and I will be going to a conference down at Pace University on this very subject. So 
for tonight, we, I'd like to ask Lori Lee to walk you through these two uh, potential local laws. We'd like you just to take the information, let us go to this conference tomorrow, see if we learn anything additional, and then we'll bring it back in two weeks and we can take more formal steps once you've had an opportunity okay. to consider sure. it. So I'll turn it to Lori Lee to discuss if she could walk us through these two laws. I'm sorry, I don't. I didn't That's really okay. That's okay. <laughs> I swear. Okay. Um, I'd like to start with the one that's entitled Certificate of Occupancy. Mm -hmm. uh, what this requires is for an individual upon a transfer or the items that are listed in item one, two, three, occupancy and use of a building hereafter erected, structurally altered or moved or any change in the use of an existing building would trigger the need to come in and request a certif Certificate of Occupancy. As you know, um, a certificate of occupancy requires an inspection. So this would be um, an appropriate reason to um, inspect the property. Number two would be the occupancy use or any change in the use of any land. Um, third would be occupancy or use after sale or transfer of any improved real property, including an individual condominium unit and an individual cooperative unit. Um, this would be a requirement where they would have to request as part of their closing procedure no earlier than 60 days before the scheduled closing of title they'd have to come in and request a certificate of occupancy mm -hmm. and it's the obligation of the seller unless in the contract they could delegate that to the purchaser mm -hmm. so these three items would require the need to come in and request from the building department or other, I mean, whatever we we could we could create Good. a department of certificate of occupancy, but I don't mm -hmm. think that would be efficient. Um, and I envision this actually finding its way into the code to bolster the existing requirements for obtaining certificates mm -hmm. of occupancy. But it can be um, effective as a standalone chapter in the code as well. So there are many options for that, and that's a procedural issue that you know we can talk about at a future time. So we're just Great. looking sort of at the substance of this. And it would include uh, the need to come in and um, I would like to produce instruction sheets, and put people on notice, make sure the realtors in the local area know. So that it would entail some education component because it is a change. Um, and I think as Richard mentioned, this legislation is in use up in Peekskill. Good. Mm -hmm. They, um, Richard spoke with them at Peekskill, um, had a conversation, and they feel that the, the program has been a success. Um, you can't void a transfer or negate a recording of a deed. Of course, it would not affect the transaction itself, okay. but it, it's just another way, another tool it would to use. use. the actual use of the property. Because well, that, if the you use... You can't move in if right. there's no C of O. Yeah, I'm, I'm right. just saying that, that if yeah. you can't get a C of O, you can't use the property... Legally, I can mm -hmm. sell it to you, but you can't move in. Yeah, but well, no, that that uh, again, like I said, the process would go along under the law um, because you cannot thwart mm -hmm. the lawful transfer of property rights from individual A to right, individual right. B. It, but it, it, no, we're no, not. I can sell it to you, but you can't move in without a C of O. You can move in, huh? but you, yeah, you, you can't legally. Yeah. But you could be the subject of an enforcement so, action if so, that should happen. It, you know, one. I'm sorry. Go ahead. When and if we pass this resolution to make part of our zoning uh, laws, how would I know if I'm a realtor, if I'm a homeowner, that I'm buying a house? How do I know that I need a CFO? Well, like I said, there would have to be an educational component okay. to roll this out. Um, you know, you may consider rolling it out without the fee for a certain amount of time to in, be an incentive. I mean, there are many ways to go about it, and we could inquire on how Peekskill rolled it out, but it it would have an essential public notice component where you would need to a allow for some time for the realtors to understand the process for, you know, for the, the notice to, to find its way out into the community. So pretty much we'll have to go out and reach out to all all the lawyers and the, uh, and, and the realtors yes. and all the banks that run that air, uh, at least well, within yeah. Austin, so they all will know. Right. What is so going the realtors on. come into the assessor's office to mm -hmm. get a copy of sure. the card 
and we can hand it to them. Correct. So that That's what I said. Hard. An instructional yeah. sheet with instructions, um, a form. Yeah. Um, you know, you'll have to add a fee to, uh, assigned to this, so you'll have to. Well, there is a fee for this. For to yes, get a but if, right now. if you wanted this to be a specialized fee, you you can look at options um, to way to tailor this. Um, it is seventy-five dollars. Addition. That's right. <laughs> I knew it was coming back to that, right? Yeah. You know, there's so much turnover in realtor land uh, mm -hmm. that you actually have to constantly remind people. Well, that is new yeah. People and people yes. retire. I, I just wanted to comment that because the banks are so difficult now, the realtors are super vigilant about coming into the building departments and actually determining what COs exist. Okay. So once the word is out there that you cannot transfer a property in the village of Austin without getting a brand new CO, they will be very compliant. And when I talked to the village ma or city manager up in uh, Peekskill, because I was asking about this law, is Lori related? He said it's really been uh, worked so effectively. Everybody knows, all the title company knows. It's just a question of notice. And so, you know, that just education as Lori described. Okay. Right. So we're good with that. We'd have to adapt some, pl some of our existing forms because yes. there's some yeah. language, as you can yes. see. Um, so so let's F, item F, the certificate of occupancy shall state the following things. So mm -hmm. we, want, we would want to make sure that we geared up, we move forward. And again, the, uh, the title companies would be um, informed. That, so, I mean, it's a, it's a process. Okay, good. good. John, did you have a comment? No, I just I wanted to understand which which of the three um, descriptions fall under the sale thing. I guess it's item three, right? three. Yeah. which is occupancy or use after sale or transfer. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Then you have to meet that cri the criteria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's underneath that. Right. Okay. This this you is are, not a change in a tenant, for you example. Are correct, this sir. is actual property yeah. right mm -hmm. to transfer fee title. Okay. Uh, so a, very short. No, I'm sorry. Oh, I guess, and I guess there's another part of the code that. Mm -hmm. or or yes, okay. that would be it. Um, the violations we'd have to set forth. The, the, we have a general catch-all provision in our code for enforcement, and I, I would imagine we would make reference to that. And, and it the would pillory. Be, yes, and there would be public flogging. Yes, of pillory and flogging. <laughs> okay, I, I would just be interested in that in that portion of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the legislation. You're into flogging? Sure. No, the well, floggings well, will continue till right. morale improves. I think the financial uh. penalties for people who live in houses that are yeah. certified to occupy yeah. shouldn't be lenient. It sounds like if we have a similar experience well, to Peakskill that we won't get we a lot of um, backlash. But I was just wondering if you had uh, gotten any feedback to this point from any of the realtors or banks or attorneys that um, – do a lot Sorry. of business in the village of Austin. Have you heard from any of them Well, yet? since we're just starting the process and we're just looking at uh, language and inquiring uh, uh, with other communities, we haven't rolled it out. And it's certainly we, we would seek right. those kinds of comments as the process moved forward. Um, yeah. These are two yeah. sample legislations because it was the guidance that you had provided to mm -hmm. me. So um, the short answer is I haven't reached out to those individuals yet because we're not I'm, I'm not positive in what direction y you eventually would like to go. So I want to get a real good handle on that. And like Richard said, tomorrow we'll be educated as well because the topic of the roundtable at the Corp Council's meeting is this Great. very same, plus three or four other kinds of options. So, does it, And does anybody know what is the current cost for a uh, certificate of occupancy? Well, pretty much it's in it, the budget. It, yeah, it, it also depends how much, if you need an architect, if you need to legalize this space, so mm -hmm. it's not just that, but a building permit. If let's say a building bless permit, you. a regular fee for building permit, if you were to finish bless the basement, you. bless you, it was a hundred dollars. I'm just saying a figure. But if you have to legalize it, it doubles, mm -hmm. and then you have to get the COA. And I'm not sure. I think it may be seventy-five dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Ironically, Tom, Tom, is okay. looking, Tom is looking it up. Okay. Yeah. In the meantime. Oh well. Yeah, what, was the, what was last year's? A buck three eighty. Uh, last year was uh, fifty dollars for buildings or alterations up to fifty thousand dollars. One hundred dollars for buildings up to one hundred thousand. One hundred fifty dollars for buildings up to one hundred fifty thousand. 
and two hundred dollars over one hundred fifty thousand. But what about the certificate of occupancy? Th that was a certificate of it occupancy. Was. Oh, it is. That's okay. 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 Yeah. okay. So, so right. you would have to amend it to specific to this legislation, establish right. an, a dollar amount. Right. Or were you talking about the pre-inspection letters? No. 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 But yeah. I th to me personally, I, I will leave it the way we have it me now. Too. I wouldn't change at all. I mean, yeah. we're just, just modifying the law. We're not modifying anything else. Leave it's the just fees like the same. Leave the fees the same. But I think we have to. But we have to add a provision for a CO upon a transfer. It yeah. doesn't exist. Right. No, we just well, add that. We'll leave the same. Yeah, you just add that. It will be that. the same amount, though. It's just a regular CO. But law. also, we are going into the but, new budget period. By the time we on, get this done, we may be looking at changing the yeah, and, later. Yeah, so and your CO fee schedule right now is based upon the cost of the improvements, which is upon a transfer, it, it's a, it would be a flat dollar fee for mm -hmm. a CO upon a transfer. It, so, so we'd have to, I, I didn't look that far into it, but I would make a recommendation um, once right, I so had some more guidance let's, on Let's take a look at what Pisco has, mm -hmm, what sure. Monquisco has, what Brewster has, and then we'll, and we'll be something in, in, the, in the middle. With $75 as a backup. <laughs> okay, the second item <laughs> the second item is a proposed registry, uh, landlord registry, and this is really uh, taking data and information from individual landlords. Um, it, it provides just an, a second or third layer of information available to your code enforcement officers. Um, it would be a registration. Um, there, I, I recently was sent uh, the draft form for a, a registry and you know I, I would have to develop this would be a specific registration form much like the registration form we just um, we're going to consider later in this evening's agenda for the the apiary registration it would need to be that level of detail uh, I could develop something specific but this would require anyone um, even in com um, mixed use uh, properties would require them to um, pay a fee, a nominal fee, uh, to register their properties, and it would be an. an um, I envision this as an annual registration, so that you would require annual updates, and if there were any changes made to the property, if change in ownership or change in property manager, or anything like that, it would be the same as your ABR registration. Within 10 days of any change, they have to file those updates in writing. So you could keep a database, some more um, effective database. So uh, again, you run into the problem with people who are, are leasing or renting, and you're not aware of that. So it, it's, it's effective only in so far as the landlords would come forward and voluntarily give the information. And it's an extra $25 a year for everybody. Well, I, I assigned it a dollar amount of $25 because the sample I was looking at um, talked about that sort of nominal fee of $25. But really, we could assign any fee. It could be $5, $10, $50, $500. I mean, it, this is really just to provide that database, that secondary database for reference by your code um, enforcement officers. My feeling about it is, is while I like the idea of this because it will minimize the people who are abusing the properties will be able, right? When they register it, when you register your property, if, if, if you have 14 apartments in there and you only said you have two, well, now you've committed perjury and I can put them in jail, yes? Well, well not you, you personally. No. You, not right. you personally. The but, but penalties but, but, for offenses are at the, at the back. Uh, I'm saying that a commission would be a, a civil penalty um, in an amount. Again, this I envision this as a standalone chapter, standalone okay. chapter. My it would not be in your zoning code. It would not be included in other provisions. So it would give you the right to establish a civil penalty between 250 and 1,000. That would be levied by the court. You'd what about a this. criminal penalty? See, because I, I, I don't think it has enough teeth. I think that if you sign an official document, and, the la and, and what you've certified is untrue, uh, can we make this the kind of document where if, if, if what you put in is not the truth, you get arrested? I want there to be a criminal penalty for this. Uh, okay. I, I, want, I want landlords okay. to be put on notice that if you put illegal housing in Austin, you're going to go to jail. Well, but this is, but this is a registration. This is a, this is a little different. Yeah. We're not 
force them. We can't force people right. to do the registration. And well, gonna you, are gonna, you are going to force them to do the no, registration I want to, no, with absolutely. the penalties. We are requiring registration, and, okay. requ and I, I, I want to say that not only are we requiring you to register, we're requiring you to tell the truth. Well, if the, you lie the, and we catch you, mm -hmm. I want there to be the, a criminal penalty the, for this. The I, want, I want to send Scott, uh, Scott out. You know, in a police car with the lights going, and and, and cart these landlords off to jail. Well, um, I I believe that there is a, a provision of the CPL, the criminal procedure, the criminal um, penal law that that would apply to signing a sworn statement with. We, I'd like to put it in the form. a false statement. Yeah, I'd like so. to see that on the form that they signed the registration That's form. So true. it says yeah. false statements could result yes. in fines up to X and uh, right. incarceration of so many months or years or days in a pillory or whatever it is we okay. decide to do. I just um, would caution that you cannot create the wording for a crime that doesn't already exist on the book. So, no, you'll find so it. I would have to I would have to be sure that we're putting the applicable reference yeah. on the registration form That's itself. What I'm asking you so to in do. addition to the civil penalties for failing to register, there would be these penalties that you're putting people on notice for swearing a false statement. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, we, we just happen to have some of our um, police department leadership. Would would either uh, our captain or our chief like to speak to this? Because there seems to be some head shaking in the room. Huh. I've never heard of someone doing this. Could you? And we can only do it if the attorney agrees to prosecute. This is true. And unless that would be something, that would be a, a discussion you really should have with the district attorney's office. Mm -hmm. If they're unwilling to prosecute it, I don't know if they might have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it's an I, I would caution putting it in the body of the law. I would well, I would chat with the DA. Restrict the language to that which already exists in the penal law and quoting yeah. that language let's, on the let's, form. Let's quote the penal quote this, the, 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 the criminal code. Correct. Right? And let's have a chat with the district attorney saying we want to do this. If we do this, will you back us up? I have no problem giving her a call. Right. Uh, oh no. I, I would, would you would reach you rather out. do it? <laughs> yes. I'm happy to if you don't want to. No, I'm good. Not a problem for me. <laughs> Um, you know that swearing a false statement is um, subject to prosecution at the, it would have to be at the discretion, of course, of the district attorney. So yeah. we would have to make a complaint to the district attorney and right. who would have to pick up the case. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. John, did you have a comment? Yeah, yeah. I, I, just with respect to the, uh, the, the registry part, would, um, would we require it to be a notarized uh, document? Yes. Yes, it would have to be a sworn, sworn okay, statement. Okay, so it's, it, so it's going to be a witness document mm -hmm. that, that, Correct. that that individual actually signed the registry form and, mm -hmm. Correct. and they are who they say they are when they do. That's, that's good. I just wanted to, um, to acknowledge uh, something that is included in this registration form, which is that um, part of what you're swearing to is either that you live at this property or that you have assigned someone to care and manage for this property who lives in the county of Westchester. Mm -hmm. um, that's certainly not a requirement that we have of property owners right now. Am I, am I correct? Or Not only that, but it's certainly true that a lot of them don't live in the right. no, community or... Or have, have an, a, a local um, or relatively local person who is responsible for the care right. of that property. That, that to me, is a, a significant improvement mm -hmm. in um, our ability to enforce yeah, I agree. The code. So um, I, I really like that element of it. Thank yes. You. And where, do, where does this, uh, where do we copy this idea from? It it's already exists in another community. Yeah, the, uh, actually it's um, Port Chester and Mount Kisco. Mount Kisco. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's sort of an amalgamation. I took the best of all the worlds and tried to. Yeah, it's nice work. Customize it. Thank you. I, like it. I do have something to say. Anything else? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I apologize. It's okay. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. Um, you know, I think uh, the ideas that we, that I had originally um, on this registration is definitely to try to minimize it or try to eliminate illegal apartments or illegal use of a single family, two family, three family use. Uh, with this, I think we're going to have. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to eliminate it totally, but we're definitely going to try. To, it's definitely going to minimize a lot 
80 to a 90 percent with this going forward I'm a little hesitant in regards to uh, put them in, in jail and, and, and all that. Um, you know, I, I, these are not, I, these are not I, 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 I understand where he's going. I, I understand wh where he's going. And, and yes, I agree we should have some hefty penalties um, for this instead. Uh, I, I think our police officers have a lot better things to do it, I, I think. Um, dealing with all the issues than actually going to a house and arresting a, a landlord. Um, you only got to do it a couple of times. I, I, I actually... Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, but I do agree that we, de we definitely have... This will definitely help. It has to be notarized. It has to be right in their face. And if they do lie, you know, they definitely have to pay the price. That I agree. I don't think Monquisco goes that far. I, I definitely... I. You know, I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, I, yeah and, and yeah, their, no, no, no. their registration the law, I, I, requires I a ever, sworn yeah. statement. So no, 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 I agree. Any, any. I, I give you that application. I know I read it. The thing is, I don't think they have arrested anyone. I haven't heard anybody, and I don't think that ever happened in I, again, it, either. Again, it would have so. to be prosecuted at the discretion of the district attorney. So even if we brought it to the district attorney's attention, um, it's highly unlikely that they would prosecute things well, such well, as this. Let's have a chat with them first. But I will, I will run yeah. this form when it's developed. I'll run the form by them. And it's, again, swearing a false statement is, yes. exists in the penal code. So mm -hmm. um, it, w it would just be another example of, of um, enforce an enforcement issue. Y you know, a funny thing, um, when uh, different, seemingly different groups um, find common ground. Uh, Bob is a big fan of lots of uh, forms of enforcement. Um, and uh, if you talk to uh, housing advocates who are uh, very concerned about um, safe and uh, fair housing practices for people who are of lower income and, uh, you know, workforce housing, um, they're big advocates for having um, significant penalties for landlords, including jail time. So uh, I certainly think there's a lot of research that would need to be done before we put anything in writing. But um, just as we're trying to create more tools for our code enforcers to be able to address um, the concern of overcrowded housing in our community for the many reasons that we're all aware of, um, we want to give more tools to our, our legal team and to the judges to be able to really make exactly. it stick. Exactly. They put, they put our, not only do they put the people who live there at risk, but they put our cops our, our volunteer ambulance corps and our fire department at risk when there's a problem in those houses. And yes. I don't want to wait until one of our first responders is injured or killed before we have a law that has actual teeth. And I want a law that we really enforce. There are so many laws on the books. Best example, New York City has a law that if you commit a crime with a fi while you have a firearm with you, whether you use it or not, there's supposed to be a mandatory one-year additional jail time for that. And in the 20 some odd years since that law's been on the books, a crimp, not one criminal has served one day under that law because it gets plea bargained away, you know, every time. I don't want laws that are just there so that it looks like the politicians are creating the illusion of doing something about a problem rather than solving it. If we're going to pass a law, the law should have teeth and it should be strictly enforced uh, if, we're, if it's going to make a difference. Otherwise, we're just, you know, putting a Band-Aid on a sucking chest wound. Okay, so thank you for all the comments. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the, on the, the advantage of the sworn affidavit is you can put right on there along the uh, lines of what Bob's describing, you know, a false statement made on this document is a violation of the New York State Penal Law. So you can get people's attention. And the other thing is I think we'll be able to take that sworn statement and if that landlord appears in court, we'll be able to use it against them. So that is a very big value. And these are three big steps. Uh, so thank you for all that. And we'll attend the seminar tomorrow, and we hope to bring you back with uh, a more complete product in two weeks. Okay. okay. Good. Thank, thank, you. Right. thank you. Okay, the next item is uh, turn it over to Corporation Counsel Laura Lee to uh, update everyone in terms of where we are with the beekeeping legislation and the regulations. Okay, um, as you know, we closed the public hearing for public comment period. Um, we kept it open for um, additional written submissions, and we did receive one 
written submission, and I need to read it into the record, so you have it complete. If I could find what I did. Um, it was received, uh, as you know, the deadline was Friday, close of business at 4 o'clock, so we could compile them. We received one written submission. It's from an individual, Blake Rowe, um, who stated the following. Good morning, Christina. I just wanted to add my voice to the chorus of, in favor of beekeeping in our village. Honey bees are not dangerous. They have no interest in or aggression towards people. There are only two ways a person can be stung, if they step on one while barefoot or if they attack the hive itself. Beekeeping is also a virtuous hobby. Being a caretaker of a hive increases biodiversity and pollination and in general adds to the health of the environment. I saw the proposed registration form for people to submit when they install a hive and I think it is well done and sends a good message about the importance of education and mentorship. Beekeeping is not a set it and forget it hobby, and it is important to be a good neighbor. I hope these comments help to inform you, everyone involved in the approval process of beekeeping. So that was the last remaining uh, public comment w we received into the record. Um, we have to proceed this evening to deliberate on the local legislation itself um, to determine whether you would like to call for a resolution to pass the local law, and I can remind you that at last week's public hearing, you took comments from f uh, four individuals, and then there was this additional written submission. So that was the total of the public comments you received on the law itself. So you would need to proceed to deliberate um, on whether you would like to proceed to a resolution, and then um, I did provide you with the sample registration form and the sample of the rules and regulations um, as would be required. Again, mm -hmm. the requirement to adopt these rules and regulations yes. with the minimum right. language is your responsibility because that's how your law is drafted. So right. um, we would need to, if you were to call for a resolution next week, you would need to pass a resolution adopting the, re the initial rules and regulations so you could proceed to um, enforce the law. Yeah, I'd like I'm to do that. I'm frankly surprised that uh, when we first started talking about this law, there were a lot of emails and Facebook messages against doing this, and yet at this point in the process, no one came forward, either written or, or vocal. Um, that being the case, I can only think that we have great support out there for it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think you know, I think the other part of it is that, you know, as more information and education got pushed out there, people began to really understand, you know, what this is about and, and, and what we're doing here. And uh, um, I think uh, I think the other element of this, too, was that we had, you know, we sort of had the chickens and bees lumped together. And I think one of the things we realized is that, you know, beekeeping is clearly something very, very different. The chickens they don't fit in the hive, really. You've tried? Yeah, they, they right. don't, and they don't well, stay. <clears throat> only you would have made that connection, Bob. But, <laughs> but um, anyway, I, I, I would like to see this legislated. I, I would be in support of passing it. Yes, me too. Are there any objections to it? Well, I, I certainly don't object. I have a couple of to hear that, com actually. comments here. Uh, should, um, I, should I speak to you offline about yeah. language, Lori? No, no. Um, if, it, if, it, if it pertains to introductory local law number two, then we should talk about that at this right point. Now. If yeah. if there's a consensus and you'd like to call for a resolution on the introductory local law as it stands, we, you can do that. Or if you would like to uh, revise the language of the law, we should get the law out of the way first, and then you can proceed to talk about the proposed re regulations. Okay. My one question mm -hmm. would be, um, and I don't think it's referred to in the law, so I guess I'm, I'm asking um, uh, what would be our policy is, if there were anyone who had bees before they were legally permitted, assuming that they someday are, would we encourage them to immediately, as soon as possible, register their hive without any questions asked about the history of when this hive first appeared? Because it should be registered within 10 days of having been placed on their property mm -hmm. with the current <coughs> proposed registration. and. 
So I'm just wondering what would be our standard practice? We want people to register regardless of whether they were scofflaws before. Well, um, we're coming from a position that we didn't have registration prior to this, and if this local law becomes effective, then the requirement for registering the apiary would become effective. Um, we are not legislating this as an enforcement provision in our zoning code. It's not a use right. to be okay. right. this. As, as we have evolved through the process, mm -hmm. we are using this as a registration. So the initial registration would be as soon as 10 days after the local law would become effective. So we would hope that p individuals came forward pretty quickly um, if they wanted to get their apiaries up and running for this season because as it was explained during the process, um, there, there's a timeline and um, the bees have a life and the colony needs to be established to winter over. So. so I just want to clarify, the message that we're sending to anyone who might already have a hive is if and register. when this becomes law, register as soon as possible. And Correct. There's no penalties. And Nobody cares. Well, because they, they have to bring the jar of honey. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but but there, but it's not an enforcement issue. But we, but the point is, like mm -hmm. most people in the public don't understand that distinction. Yes. The point is, we want them to register. We won't, don't want them to hide their hive that they never legally should have had up to this point. Bring so, each okay. of your bees in. And then, my, my, I do have two comments or questions about the APR aviary registration form, but we're not ready for that, or we don't well, have to discuss if, that tonight? Well, if we are, have no changes to the actual law itself, I right. uh, just need a consensus that you would like to proceed to a vote to enact I this. I think you the, have that. You have that. I, the law was not attached for this week. It's the same thing that we uh, reviewed last week. Yeah, there were no changes. Changed. Okay. Right. Then no. yes. Right. That's fine. Okay. Right. Next. You have that uh, to draft for next week. Okay. So um, the other issues then the this? two forms that were handed out um, for this evening were the proposed APR registration form itself mm -hmm. and also the APR registration rules, instructions, mm -hmm. and the rules and regs. Um, you know the local law that you're going to be adopt requires you to adopt these um, mm -hmm. rules and regs. So, yeah, now would be the time to look at language for the rules and regulations. Um, at the uh, the paragraph that begins, beekeepers must identify a mentor. On the I'm sorry, on the AP register, the rules and regs page, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. the form, but the instructions page. Um, I really like the language that you use on page two of the registration form. Section three refers to a mentor slash alternate beekeeping contact information, um, and it, I I was hoping we could use that language again in this paragraph. Um, where? I believe it's the third paragraph um, that starts yes. off. Beekeepers must identify a mentor. Yeah. Well, oh, there. If we could just yes. um, no. use that same language, mentor slash alternative Got beekeeping it. contact. And no the problem. reason why is just because no problem. someone Got who's it. an extremely experienced beekeeper, I don't think, should That's be required to identify a mentor necessarily. Of course. So, although the new ones we certainly would encourage mm -hmm. very That's a good enthusiastically. Comment. Um, and then my only other comment was um, some of the language uh, in the rules and regs portion number five. Um, Which mirrors your local law. Right, okay. So if you're going to make changes to this, then we should go back and make changes to the local law. Okay, well, let me, let me, uh, then let me say it out loud and see if you think this, is, okay. uh, this makes sense. Um, section C of that below makes a reference to swarms, as, uh, mm -hmm. including as one of the potential mm -hmm. nuisances. Um, I'll wait till you find it. Yeah, okay. I'm in the local law. So lo uh, letter C of five in the rules and regs mm -hmm. refers to swarms. Um, so it seems unnecessary um, to refer to swarms in the opening statement of number five. Uh, is it dot, dot, uh, prepared at all times to respond immediately to be swarms and to remediate all. Could we just eliminate that, respond immediately, and go right to, to remediate all nuisances? Because swarms is specifically referred to below. Okay. I'm just I'm trying to see the mirror language from the code. Okay. Be keeping included following the shifts post compass. Okay. All right. It just seems a little um, cleaner, and, and you've, you've tightened up a lot of the language here. I compared the two versions, but that was one thing that stood out to me. So 
that makes sense. Just taking it out as an isolated because it's included below. Yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, you take that comment. Got it. I mean, unless unless there's a you know cause to include that, but other than that, I think it's fantastic, and I'm so Got grateful it. for all of your incredible work on this. It's this was an excellent example of. Um, Collaboration versus compromise. And compromise, everybody's a little less happy. And this is collaboration. Uh, everybody, uh, the village is better protected. Beekeepers um, are able to take responsibility for themselves and um, not be limited to some arbitrary limitations of uh, setbacks. And the community is better informed uh, just through this process. And going forward, we're uh, going to be providing resources for people. It's, it's a, it was a really excellent uh, experience. And I, I thank everyone who helped make it possible. Right. And there will be a lot of happy nuns when this is done. We and like happy nuns. Yeah. And we like happy I, nuns. I, I would Move like on. to actually uh, also point out for um, Trustee DeRio's benefit that the last page is a certification and acknowledgment. And there is, um, there is a notari notarized. So this would be a sworn to oath as well. So this is the same kind of thing that we are envisioning for the last <laughs> bit. Good. Okay. Just so you know. Thank okay. you. So should I go right on to the next one? Yeah, should I go right on to number one? Please do. Okay. So we'll need to proceed to the deliberations on local law number one, which were the changes to vehicles and traffic to reflect the additional um, meter zone at the top right. of Central Avenue, to reflect the changes in overnight parking along Cedar Place, and to also reflect the two more the two additional long-term spaces, spaces behind right. the, um, the, the current construction um, at the old and, We Can Do It property. We already agreed to that, right? Yes. Yep. Yes. We don't have any problems. So, no. No. all right. So, I will put a resolution on then adopting local law number one as right. well as law number two, Thank and you. also right. a resolution would then be to adopt your initial rules and regs for number two. Okay. Good job. Thank you. And then Thank you. Thursday, the backs will be coming off from the meters. No, you have to wait. <laughs> you have to wait till this is filed up in Albany, and you have to wait for Albany to send back a receipt to file. How long does it take that again? Uh, we can check with the clerk's office, but usually it's two weeks minimum. Okay. okay. We'll get it up there as soon as possible. Good. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. And now we have certiorari. Uh, continuing, Lori Lee, uh, update on tax certiorari metallized carbon. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, we accept negotiated settlements the town, with the town assessor's office. This is one of those negotiated settlements. I'd like to seek your approval to put a resolution on authorizing this. Um, you can see the itemization um, as was provided to you as backup, right. which now is escaping me. It's a, um, a, a significant amount. It's 54,970,037. And it's for them? assessment year 2007 through to 2013. Yeah. Can we send them on payments? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think that that's permitted, so. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. But we don't, have, we don't really have a choice here. It's either that or go to court and then end up paying it anyway. Correct. We, yeah, we don't even have that choice. Right. If, if we don't pay it on time, they start adding interest. No. So, so we have to do this. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay, great. And again, Lori, uh, update on the uh, fire department mutual aid contract with the county. Good evening. <laughs> How are you tonight? Um, we have been notified through the fire department to take a look. Um, the county is proposing, has proposed, um, a, a comprehensive change instead of individual IMAs with all of the participating 58 departments in the county of Westchester they're proposing a standardized document uh, what I would like to do is put it on for uh, an approval resolution subject to my finalization I do have a call in just to double check on a few minor language but this has actually been developed as a result of um, the law department at the county, input from the local fire chiefs, and also um, standards for the state of New York uh, on mutual aid programs. I have two questions. Yep. Question one is, have you spoken to our fire chiefs, and do they approve yeah, Bob, of this? I can, I can address that. Yes. I, I spoke with Jason Lorenz about this, and uh, all the chiefs are on board uh, with this. They've been working with Lori Lee and talking to her about this. So uh, Perfect. I spoke to Jason a couple of days ago and also this e just this evening actually late this afternoon about it. Good. So uh, they uh, handed it off to Lori Lee. They, they wanted to be here this evening. They had some other obligations, but right. uh, that's why I'm sort of speaking for them. as LEA. Thank yeah. you. So that takes care of that. The second thing is, does this address, I know there, there are sometimes, there was an issue recently 
with the mutual aid with the police department mm -hmm. and liability insurance. Correct. That's that's the topic that I have a call into the commissioner just to double check that that has been addressed, and In I this. certainly would not advise signing it unless the concerns that we had with the mutual aid for the police department, and I have a copy of that, and I've actually sent that to him with the section in question. So because mayhaps if this works for the fire department, perhaps we could also take it and adapt it for police department as well, so that there could be a county-wide and not have the liability issue uh, that we've had in the past and make a blanket. Sure. It looks like we have a template sitting there. The chief is taking Right. Well, I can take yeah. Yeah. yeah, but but this this, this no no no, but you could right. But it looks like a lot of the the work's been done because w with them you don't, you wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. Well, it, it's a it's a slight bit different because a police um, mutual aid involves the use of deadly force, and of course a fire mutual aid would not involve the use of deadly force. Well, let's so, hope not. So uh, there's not nearly the amount of litigation involved with the mutual aid with the fire department. And we haven't had any litigation or claims related to mutual aid. The mutual aid agreements exist and right. have existed, and our fire department is called on on a regular basis. Oh, I know. I got And it. the individual fire departments are handling with aplomb the claims that may arise in their individual okay. municipalities. So I, I do Thanks. have a clarification question into the commissioner. And Good. If, Thank you. I'm looking forward to his answer. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. So our treasurer is here to speak to the uh, board about proposed budget modifications. Tom? Um, yes, um, good evening again, Mayor, members of the Board of Trustees. Um, I just submitted one budget modification, and that was to establish a capital project for our um, CHIPS uh, street paving uh, projects in uh, 2014, since the uh, contractor has been going around and doing some work. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that we do annually, is to establish a new CHIPS capital project. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes at the same time, we actually close the prior year CHIPS mm -hmm. project and bring forward the um, re remaining balance, but uh, right now we're in the midst of waiting for uh, CHIPS reimbursement on some of our prior year expenses. So I wanted to wait on that portion of the budget modification, but I just wanted to establish a uh, capital project for 2014 uh, using some of our current year uh, CHIPS um, allotments. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, Tom. Tom. So that's a resolution for next week as well? Yes. Great. Okay, the final item on the uh, public uh, portion of the meeting is uh, Trustee Liaison Report, so I turn it back to the mayor. Okay, Victoria, why don't we start with you? Sure. Uh, I'll just say that things are going along swimmingly with the uh, Northern Westchester Energy Action Consortium, um, and as I've mentioned to folks, we are in a transition time where um, we've been waiting for New York State to give us an approval. If you're a nonprofit organization and you want to change anything in your bylaws, it's, uh, it's quite a lengthy process, longer than we had anticipated. Um, and um, really the only change that we'll be making is a change of name uh, to become Sustainable Westchester and um, the provision that would allow us to uh, invite every municipality in the entire county of Westchester to join in with this group so that the mission of providing um, the member municipalities of which the Village of Austin is a charter member, um, and now we could expand to over 40 municipalities in the county uh, with many of the programs. You heard us talk, be here us talk about Energize every week, and that was the, uh, the first program that NWIAC undertook, and there are many others um, that have begun um, and that will continue and that will grow and um, so uh, things are moving along with the marketing and uh, perhaps even hiring with the uh, the first person to be paid to work in this transition because right now it's a team of us who get together every other week um, and, okay, and good. collaborate um, I hope to have more updates on the EAC soon. I will say that our Landlord Tenant Relations Council, um, which was uh, mostly on an, you uh, gathered on an as needed basis for many years. Um, earlier this year, we met for the first time 
as a group um, and just looked at what the code says that the group is capable of doing. Um, and that's a lot more than just meeting as needed if a complaint comes up. Uh, we met last night and we had a, um, a guest come to speak to us uh, who uh, is an advocate for affordable housing. It was a very interesting conversation um, because the uh, Landlord-Tenant Relations Council, for those who don't know, is made up of both landlords and tenants and one um, non-landlord tenant person. Um, and so uh, any um, regulations that are existing in other communities that we may want to adapt here, uh, you know, meet with a variety of responses. So it, it's, uh, it's an interesting process and uh, we look forward to uh, the group is, is very excited about learning more and understanding more about um, housing practices and policies here in the village and uh, our existing housing stock. So it's, uh, we're sort of at the beginning of this uh, exploration and um, at some point perhaps they'll have some recommendations of what the board might want to consider if there are any uh, um, new projects that we may want to implement or uh, modifications we want, may want to make to how we approach housing in the village. Did uh, your your guest was Dennis Hanready? Yes. Did he propose any legislation that uh, you should consider? Well, at this point, what we talked about was ETPA, which is the Emergency Tenant Protection Act. Um, it's a program that's in place in about 20 municipalities in uh, the county. Um, and uh, Marlene Cheatham was in attendance, and so she gave us some history on uh, from her perspective of how it had been considered and. Um, chosen not to be implemented in the past, and Dennis gave his perspective on um, the value that he thinks it presents to the communities where it exists and um, how that might be different from our current status. So there certainly was not any uh, consensus on what a decision should be. It was really a, it was a, an interesting and lively conversation and, and a start of a conversation. Okay. John? Thank you. Um, so the uh, fire department is uh, going through some election appointments of officers for the different firehouses. Um, um, Jason and the chiefs are going to be meeting with the individual houses over the next week or so to establish all that. Um, we've got the, uh, uh, the fire inspection will be, uh, the I guess, the evening of the village fair on the waterfront, I guess, at 6.30. And uh, we also have the uh, fire parade on the 2nd of August. So those are all... Uh, those are all going on. Um, I had a chance to uh, review the uh, budget to date um, for the fire department. Um, I think, uh, not surprising, um, the ener energy and heat, heat budgets are, are pretty much maxed out. Um, and uh, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how we, we wrap up everything. The rest of the budgets are pretty much on track. Uh, with respect to the uh, Rec Advisory Board, um, we uh, had our meeting on Monday. Um, the Friday night concert schedule has been completed and should be published shortly um, and getting that out. Um, kicks off the, uh, the, the first uh, concert will be on the 3rd, which is the fireworks, not the waterfront, and there'll be a band uh, before and after. Uh, the other thing that uh, we should be hearing from Henry was that the, the Rec Advisory Board has uh, was asking about um, replacing the lights in the gymnasium. Um, these are 30-year-old uh, fixtures, and um, there are some newer options in which um, you could recover the cost, up to 30% of the cost of your lighting uh, electricity bill, you know, within the first year. And it would pay for itself probably, well, with the way the cost of energy is going up, within three years you'd have a complete payback. These and LEDs? Yeah, LEDs, yeah. So um, Henry will be putting that forward. Um, <clears throat> there's also a number of other projects that we're following. Um, you know, we, uh, we're doing all the playgrounds at uh, significantly reduced, as I mentioned, uh, at the legislative session. Um, we're getting all the playgrounds done, and um, that's money well spent. Um, we're also moving forward with the uh, making sure we get all the lights at the tennis uh, courts, making sure we get all those lights working as well as the basketball courts all at the same time. And we'll be uh, doing a tour next month of, uh, uh, of, of, you know, really some of the, some of the different parts of, uh, uh, of the recreation areas, and just as usually every year we do a tour and, and look and see what's going on. So, um, so that's, uh, that's my update. 
Thank you. Thank you. One more. Uh, yeah, actually, um, even though I missed the meeting, the HPC meeting, uh, it's actually a pretty interesting. It was a pretty interesting meeting <coughs> where um, Hudson Steps is back, I guess. Uh, they recently made a new application for 34 State Street. Uh, so they're going to reviewing, be reviewing uh, one of the, actually, one of the landmark uh, properties that we have in there, which is the Smith Robinson House mm -hmm. as well. So we're just going to have to wait and see what happens there. I think uh, it should be something interesting. We'll see what happens. That's pretty much it. I've seen uh, the design they've proposed for the Smith Robinson House, which um, has now two staircases in the front. And at some point, a hundred and some odd years ago, it had one staircase. And then it had two staircases before that. And it, uh, it was discovered, Miguel Hernandez uh, found a piece in an eBay sale or someplace uh, which showed the house the 1840s with one staircase. So they have switched the design to one staircase. Yeah. The building also originally had a cupola, uh, and they have, it was not in their last design. It currently is. They've hired uh, an, uh, a consultant who is uh, an historical architect. A cupola consultant? A cupola consultant, <laughs> yeah. Um, and they've actually taken seriously their role as preserving this really beautiful building. Uh, earlier on, it was rather sketchy as to whether or not they were going to take that seriously. But because we changed the law and uh, and uh, adopted uh, the, the concept of a historic preservation commission, which had teeth, they took it seriously and they've been, they've been uh, out for a while. They haven't been coming to meetings and all of a sudden they came back yeah, to this. So it's you. really quite handsome. It is, I mean, um, they, actually what, one of the things that um, Valerie and uh, the planning department has been doing is they've been doing uh, digital um, information for pretty much all the plans, all the photos. So I was looking at the, exactly the design and some of the historic photos that they have in there. So, uh, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, one of the, the other things that I wanted to mention is uh, that one of the reasons, the reason why I wasn't able to be in that meeting is because the mayor, myself, uh, Richard, and uh, our downtown manager, uh, we were interviewing uh, people for the downtown event committee. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was really interesting to see um, <coughs> so many people. I mean, we know Austin has a lot of talent as, as it is, but there was a great group of people that came in and interviewed uh, for, uh, for this committee, and, and I think it's going to be an exciting group. They're going to be doing a lot, a lot of stuff for Austin. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about that. So hopefully that should be within the next month, two months, uh -huh. maybe. Well, you said you're waiting to interview one other person. One yeah. other person? I think yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Pretty much within a month, it should be set up. Yeah. Well, OVAC, as you know, uh, Bill said earlier in the, in the meeting this evening, was that today? That was today. Yeah, yes. it seems like it was yesterday by now. Yeah. Um, the OVAC is it having the. Soon be yesterday. Yes, their, op their, their open house on, on Sunday, uh, and you can go down and see uh, some fire. Apparatus, some police cars, and uh, of course the OVAC ambulances, and get a sense of what they do. And hopefully, we can get some people to sign up. They do an amazing job, and uh, you should come down. And if if you are family folks and you have kids, the kids will have a ball. Um, at one of the uh, recent meetings, we were talking about the village fair, and uh, the artwork that uh, was going to be displayed, and they're looking for a venue. I was speaking to Jack Walsh, who just opened AJ's Fish Fry. And uh, John and I went there for lunch to try it out. By the way, you should go. The food is, is wonderful. Uh, it's very nice. Best fish and chips I've had in a long time. Uh, they also have cute little hot dogs. But anyway, um, the, 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 uh, I told him that he should contact the Chamber of Commerce and join. Um, I think he'll be a good addition to the Chamber. And he offered the wall, since it's a brand new restaurant, he hasn't done any decorating. And uh, he offered the walls of his restaurant to put those pictures up. And I'm thinking, if you got 
if you put about it, you could probably put a third of them in there, and if we found two other places through the chamber, uh, we could get all of them up and have three different places during the village fair where it would draw people into those businesses. So uh, I'm going to talk to Omar at, at the end of the night, since I'm a liaison to the uh, uh, chamber, about that, and then have them talk to you. And I sent you the email, Richard, from Jack. Yeah, so th that's all I have. Just along those lines, um, I know that the uh, the firehouse gallery, I believe, will be open for the village fair, but the selfies are all in the back room. There is a whole mm -hmm. front room that um, I, I see some easels around. I don't know if that's we, we could use that. Purpose, just if we want an additional space. Yeah. And also the firehouse, the same fire, the downstairs. downstairs right. If we open the garage door, mm -hmm. we we could do a nice. We we could pretty much between those three venues, mm -hmm. get all those pictures up. If the, there's the, nothing in there. The downstairs is frequently a well. Uh, yeah, there's a, a uh, there's a, there's an old there's there's an inflatable boat and sometimes the um, uh, the old truck the old truck which I, we could move. Th though I'm not against uh, if there's businesses that want another reason for people to walk in the door that could be that great too. too. So I'll talk to Omar about it and and, and uh, John, could you talk to the uh, fire chief about uh, that's the a, downstairs? Uh, that's a privately owned uh, firehouse. That's that's uh, that's not owned by the department or by us. Uh, it's but, steamer. It's yeah, steamer. steamer. So we'd have to have the chiefs reach steamer. out to steamer. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. That's my report. Um, and I just have one, one issue uh, with three elements to it. The county executive has uh, sent out a letter to all of the communities uh, stating that uh, the county will no longer be involved in the, uh, in the federal government uh, grants, the, the HUD grants, CDBG grants, home grants, any of that ilk uh, that he's been fighting. He refuses to, to uh, come up with uh, the evaluation of, of problems that, that uh, the, the uh, federal government's been after, and so he has shut that operation down. Um, there will be a final, perhaps, meeting of the urban uh, county consortium, which is those of us who uh, are part of that consortium get our grants through the county. So George Oros, who is chief of staff uh, for the county executive, is going to attend that. That meeting's coming up, I think, next week. It could be the following week. Um, and in the meantime, the, the county legislators uh, believe that the county executive can't just walk away from this without the approval and, and repeal legislation from the county uh, legislature. So uh, it is not looking good. Uh, and the, the reason I say that is that we, under current regulations from, uh, from the Housing and Urban Development Department, uh, we cannot directly apply to them for uh, CDBG money or home money. Home money is for constructing um, buildings. CDBG money is more for infrastructure. Um, we have to belong to, we have to get it through a larger government. Uh, and that larger government without the county for a community with fewer than 50,000 people um, has to be either a town like the town of Greenberg, which if all of its, its uh, uh, component uh, villages and its unincorporated area agree, Greenberg could become its own consortium because they have over 50,000 people, but our town cannot and according to the current regs, um, we cannot join with other towns. So the only way we could continue to apply for HUD grants is through the state. Well, the state gets a pot of money, which it divides up by everybody who is not in a consortium or a city which can apply on its own. So we would be a very small fry in a very large pond uh, to get to fight for significantly less money than, than we have ever gotten before in CDBG money. So uh, it, things look not very good for us uh, along those lines. But it's not just us. It's, it's everyone in Westchester County 
other than Mount Vernon or, or uh, uh, White Plains or Yonkers, uh, where they have enough people to apply on their own. So that, uh, I think, is it. Well, that. That's it. Yeah. So if we could have a motion to go into executive session for the purposes of discussing personnel matters. So moved. Second. Particular person. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Well, that ends tonight's uh, interesting, uh, interest-packed uh, meeting, and we, or at least the televised portion of it. Uh, we will see you next Tuesday. No, uh, next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Here I go again. Uh, next Wednesday. Oh, have it. The Lustin. Um, and uh, yes, uh, so we will see you then. And uh, have a good weekend, and please join us for the 5K race, for uh, the Riley Saper concert, um, OVAC. documentary, and all of that other stuff, the OVAC uh, open house. So have a good week.